<laughs> All right, guys. Yes, I was trying to say that tactfully. All right, uh, let's get the show. We're recording. On the road. Uh, I like having my resident Eagle Scout start with the Pledge of, Pledge of Allegiance. So, will you uh, lead us? <laughs> Blue Cow from the Sierra Okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, uh, Christina, can you take the uh, roll call? Absolutely. Rita Bettino? Here. Tom Butterworth? Here. Janet Fons? Luke Kaufman? Mike Morrow? Here. Maria Norton? Here. Kimberly Norton? Here. Hillary Orman? Here. Christina Ross? Here. Eric Thunen? Here. Benny Young. Here. Jennifer Zonis. Here. Are you on Zoom, Jennifer? No. OK. Thank you. <laughs> OK, uh, we'll call the uh, meeting to order. This is the Town of New Canaan Town Council meeting, for, regular meeting, for Thursday, March 21st, 2024. Uh, I want to thank everybody for being here tonight. Uh, it's been a long budget process as we kind of get close to the end, and I know everyone's put a lot of time and effort, and I appreciate it. Uh, we will start first with uh, agenda item number two, public comments. Members of the public are welcome to speak on any agenda item. Uh, we don't have anybody listed uh, here in the room. Is there anybody out uh, in uh, Zoom world? Anybody on Zoom? It's disappointing. Very disappointing. <laughs> Why would people want to tune in? <laughs> okay. Tell okay. More jokes. No. <laughs> Listen, this is pretty stale stuff. I'm doing my best. Okay. Uh, let's move on to agenda item number three, budget overview. Um, the agenda has been modified slightly. We're going to take Board of Ed first, so I would invite uh, Dr. Lutze and his team up and Chairman Alves, whoever else wants to take the, uh, take the dais. We appreciate it. Oh. <laughs> I was hoping you'd say that. <laughs> Thank you. Got my Coke. I'm ready to go. If you were to do a 1% cut, which page would it be? <laughs> It gets a little stale, so we try to keep it keep it fresh. <laughs> All right. Uh, Love it. <laughs> the, um, but thank you for having us back. It's good to be back with you. Folks on Zoom, I just sent an email to you that has a PDF of the packet of questions and answers. Uh, so it's. It's all, all of them from you know, Tuesday night and tonight, the ones that uh, were just sent today are at the end of the packet, and we will take a look. Um, I thought that we'd touch base on those couple of items, and there was a question or two that came up that I said we'd get back to you, and one of the questions, uh, Rita, was a question about the 9%. Where does the 9% come from in a graph that compares with the healthcare costs? Um, very briefly, the, we meet with Cigna every year. Uh, and we go in detail about the plan, the performance, the, um, of course, we don't talk about individual people, but we do look to see trends in our plan. And we spend almost, almost a day uh, talking about what opportunities might be, be um, on the, for us, be options for us to take a look at in order to uh, continue to uh, manage those costs, right? So we, look, we really go in, in detail around all of that. In that conversation this year, it was Cigna who shared with us that the average in Connecticut since 2016 has been a 9.5% spend all in on healthcare that's in Connecticut across um, the market. So that's, we use 9%. Uh, Cigna shared with us it was 9.5%, and that 9.5 is statewide uh, healthcare spends trend since 2016. Our, um, our, our spend since 2016 has been about 3%. Again, they've got all the data and graphs and everything to share to show that. Um, so we, our plan has outperformed the Connecticut market in healthcare uh, spending by, you know, we're at about, we've been at about three. Our all in is at about five. That's both medical and prescription. Just comparing other, like what is it comparing when you say? Healthcare costs. General. 
the trend general. in general yeah. healthcare costs uh, across the state. Across the state, so every mm -hmm. type of like. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep, every healthcare expenditures, yeah. healthcare costs. Right. Okay. Yep, okay. yep. So, um, so the nine's actually a little bit below the 9.5 that has been the trend. Um, and for us, that was all in prescription and uh, medical. The medical is about 9%, 9.5% or so. I believe the prescription's done a little bit higher at about 12%. Um, our prescription trends about what the prescription trends have been. But when you factor in how well our medical has performed, it, it brings our, our average down because prescription is much less than medical as well. So that's, I know it's, it's not the fine detail that I know you'd love to get into, but just on the whole, that's where the nine came from and what that chart is meant to represent. Um, the you know, questions that we were looking at today, and I know we had lots of questions from last, uh, from Tuesday as well, glad to go into detail about any of them, uh, but thought that staffing is a question and something that has continued to be on the table. So I wanted to address just one or two of those, those pieces. Um, and I mentioned it before, one of our challenges this year is the ending of those COVID era grants that have, has helped to support some positions that we've learned are, are quite important that we, and we want to continue. So those are moving out of the grant into the budget. They don't show up as new positions in our staffing plan because we already have the positions, but the funding just shifts over, right? So there's, there's that, plus then there's new initiatives or new positions. And again, the new ones, new positions are really driven by a couple of different things, which I was thinking about, and it's on the last page of the handout I gave you tonight. So there's a couple of um, tables. Really, a number of them are driven due to changes in legislation. They're, change, they're driven legislatively. So that's your, our pre-K position. Right? If not for the change in the law, we wouldn't need an additional section of pre-K. And so we wouldn't have that position on there, but the law is changing as we talked about on Tuesday. Um, the same goes with financial literacy, right? There's a change in the law around financial literacy that all graduates um, in three years from now, well, if you include this, it's four, but this year's current freshmen and beyond all must have at least 0.5 credits in financial literacy prior to graduation. Uh, as is the case a lot of times with legislative changes, they're well intended and they're good ideas. Um, one of the new things in the last couple of years is that we haven't had much runway to prepare. It's just been happening. It's just the laws, it changes in the spring and it's implemented right away that school year instead of having a little bit of time. That's the case for, uh, again, for instance, for our uh, launch students and their eligibility to remain in school and launch to the end of the school year in which they turn 22 instead of until they turn 22. Great, I think it's a great idea. I mean, we really love those families, love serving those kids, we want them to be with us, but we only had two months and the budget had already been completed. So, you know, we are reacting as quickly as we can to those things. Does the, does the law actually mandate any type of specific amount of a teacher position or is it like specific curriculum that just needs to be incorporated Instead around the financial, financial literacy not, not yeah the you understand for, I for sure, the sure. No, what, it, what the law uh, requires is 0.5 credits for students as a graduation requirement from high school so what we did is we we analyzed our program currently and we identified that some of our courses will count towards the that financial literacy credit that they need so economics, for instance, a few others, they, they cover the standards, we'll have to make some modifications to the curriculum, uh, but we are already staffed in those areas, so we should be okay with kids that are enrolling in those courses. Mm -hmm. In looking at it, we learned that about 35% or so of our students don't take a course currently that is uh, that would be considered that 0.5 credit. So in that regard, we have to create either more of those classes that we have or create a new program specifically to attract those students in. But the, the way that we run now, just using the courses that we have, about 35% of a class won't have that 0.5 credit. And that's who we're targeting with the 0.6. And our classes run about 300, 330. So about 35% of them, you know, it's um, a little over 100 kids or so. Are there any uh, grant funded positions that you're not continuing so that you've decided to let the grant run out and Mm -hmm. Or are we carrying all of them over? So we were very careful not to overstaff with the grants. Mm -hmm. uh, instead, we used them for some other purposes, like the Summer Academy that we started, which was a summer program for students who we identified as um, likely getting the most benefit out of that program. And so, and it was an invite only kind of thing. And we covered all the costs in that through the grants. So transportation, food, staffing, 
all of it was was done and and purposefully for those kids and those families. Um, so we knew that that was going to be a temporary thing until the grant funding ran out. Uh, we did some other things with um, some contracted services around special education and some testing and things. Uh, we were, as you'll recall in the beginning, we were not going to continue the social worker position at SACS, mm -hmm. and that's a grant funded position. And then when we made, had the conversation about kids in crisis, so that one was not going to be, but we shifted that back in. And uh, there's a need there. There's a need there, one or the other, for sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which is why, and again, we prefer the in on staff social worker for us at SACS. Um, so really, we, we were as thoughtful as we can be. There probably are, you know, I'd have to look around. Um, there might be a, psycho, a psychologist position. Oh, that's right, that's right, a high school special education teacher that was grant funded. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> yes, okay. this one. Mm -hmm. So again, we've, <coughs> would we like to keep it? Sure, is it the highest priority as we look at all of these? It wasn't, and that's why we're not keeping it. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Brian, one thing you've, you've touched on over the course of this budget season a little bit, but mm -hmm. I certainly would like to test out to see if you could say more about it. Um, when we look at something like the uh, math coach, just to take an example, yeah. um, in a vacuum, uh, one one uh, analysis of that is, well, we didn't used to have math coaches. Why would we need them now? Hmm. And imp you know, it seems to me that part of the answer has to be, and that's just an example, is that students are different than they are now, and teachers are different than they are now. I wonder if you could comment a little bit on that, flesh that out a little bit. Sure, I'm glad to. Um, and I do have the team here, and Dr. Crenty and others are welcome to uh, to help out. Um, but. It is, it's in response to an identified need that we have that wasn't the same need that when we looked at it, say, three, four, five years ago. Right? Um, around the staff, the positions, the staffing, we'll start there. Um, we are, the, the classroom is more complex today than it's ever been. Uh, we have fabulous staff. You know, our teachers are wonderful. They're committed. They, they're, they work very, very hard. But it's also important to know that, you know, at the elementary school, our teachers are teaching everything. They're teaching every discipline. They're doing you know, math, ELA, uh, social studies, everything throughout the course of the day. And um, the, the need is clear to continue their learning in very targeted and specific ways by somebody who is an expert in the, in the math content and an expert as a classroom teacher. Um, the role of coach had generally been shared with our, um, we have, uh, our curriculum folks who work to, they work with students as interventionists sometimes when students are struggling, they might sit with them. Uh, our math specialists uh, work with kids to catch them up as part of our response to intervention program. And then some of their time was spent working with teachers and modeling best practices and helping them. But now the needs, as the needs have expanded and intensified for kids, uh, the, mo all of their time, just about all their time is being spent doing that remediation work with kids, catching them up, doing the response to intervention type programming with them, uh, and which makes sense, right? You're going to always go, go to the kids first and going to help those students and work with them individually. But what gets lost is that longer term capacity building that's sort of that old saw about uh, give somebody a fish or teach them to fish, right? So um, we're losing that, the teaching them to fish part because we're meeting, we're hitting the most urgent need and we need to, and that's the right thing to do. So what we're looking to do with this position as we have with the classroom coach is have someone who is dedicated to doing that capacity building with our staff, who's an expert in the content area and who is an, a master teacher. Um, at the elementary level, it's also important to note, you know, those elementary certifications, uh, just about every elementary teacher, you know, they specialize in reading and, and they do pick a specialization area. But math is, is challenging for elementary teachers on the whole. Not all of them, some are outrageously good at it. Um, but generally, this is an area where, you know, you, want, you need somebody with that deep love and knowledge and understanding of the content to be mod modeling best practices, working with the teachers, and it's, um, you know, it's generally, you know, we have a coaching model that we follow. You saw from the packet on Tuesday, the new coaching indicator that we created that really focuses on the best practices around, around coaching. Um, this is not unique to New Canaan either, just for what it's worth. This is something that districts all around us have been investing in um, for quite some time. And you can say we have as well in that sort of split model, but we're seeing that the, um, the need is, is there and continues to grow. Um, the students, and again, we see it, our students are performing well. 
um, but it takes um, uh, you know the right capacity building to continue to grow and helping our teachers to make sure that they are um, knowledgeable of all of those best practices as they're working with students. Because we, we expect an awful lot of our elementary, of all of our teachers, but especially our elementary teachers, who are teaching all of the content areas, preparing our students. And as they move through the grades from kindergarten, first, second, third, fourth grade, our third, fourth grade mathematics program can be very sophisticated. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have a good grasp of the mathematics concepts and the standards, um, it can be a real challenge. And so we want to make sure that that foundational work at that youngest level with our kids as they're coming up really prepares all of them to, to excel in middle school and beyond. So and parents of Marie, themselves Maria Naughton has her hand up. Can, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the financial I mean, literacy, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, financial literacy or math coach, because the way that math is done today is very different from the, when I grew up. It really up. is. And, um, Having to Google it to help my kids with math is kind of embarrassing. <laughs> so. That's what I do. Um, so I'm like, wait, what? Yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, Maria, you have a question? Um, two questions. Just uh, for the math coach, you have 71000 for the salary, but that's really, if you look at the contract, that looks like a step, sorry about the dog, like a step six teacher, but the teachers come in basically at step three. So I'm just wondering, Will that master teacher level probably need to be someone who has more experience than that, right? Right. So uh, when we budget for something like that, we really try to um, pick an area because we don't know if it's going to be somebody internal who is promoted into the job and then we backfill that person, perhaps with somebody new uh, versus somebody from outside who would come in at a higher position. So it depends upon whether it's an internal hire or an external. And that's why we we went over what we typically use, but not by much. And it's just um, it depends on who moves into the role. We do believe that we have a few people internally who are highly qualified and would be wonderful candidates for the position. We just aren't sure if they're going to apply. So that's why we don't know exactly what it'll be. But if it is somebody internal, we backfill them, and then it's likely to be somebody at um, at or around our typical starting rate. And that's the one. Like I hesitate to add full FTEs, right? Is there a way to have like a stipend for teachers to coach, you know, just just food for thought rather than hire a new uh, a new body, have an accommodation for a teacher to be kind of a peer coach? Is that well, the, the challenge again is at the elementary level is their days are so packed that you'd have to do release time in order to do that. And then you're releasing them from the classes and they're not teaching their own kids as they're doing that. And you're bringing in a substitute to cover them when they're out. So at the elementary, especially, that's a very difficult model to do um, as a stipend. We do have uh, mentors that work with our new teachers. They do it through the team process and they help them um, work through our evaluation process. They work through the state's evaluation process, those things. But this really is, and, and again, it's, it's across all three elementary schools. So the model that we put together for the classroom coach that's working very well is about a day and a half per week in each school. And then, um, you know, so meeting, planning, and working forward on that point, other point five. Uh, and that model, we look to replicate that same model here. So although it may seem like a 1.0, it's really about a point three at each building, um, you know, as you look at it. So it's not, um, well, so it, it's, it's a significant investment. Uh, I will tell you, our principals would like to see a 3.0 FTE investment. One per school. It, it, yes. Yeah. Um, the other question I had is on the salaries. The salaries are listed on page 25, but what what is the all-in cost with benefits too? Yep. yep. So the uh, it's on question 56. Um, we sort of said right 25 and the 68, and there are the two numbers. Um, the when we build our budgets, we really don't, we don't build in benefit costs as we're building it. It's one of the advantages of being <laughs> self-insured as we are. We really don't know what those amounts are going to be. We don't know who's, if it's gonna be a single, a family or none at all. And so, and our numbers have trended downward a little bit um, through the years in our total contracts and insurance. So we're comfortable doing just straight salary as we bring people in and then adjusting in the future if we need to. Uh, but we don't, we really aren't um, moving the, the ISF deposit or the insurance costs with these anticipated positions. It's just the salary cost is what we anticipate in the budget. 
You don't, you don't think the insurance costs will go up with additional houses? Well, our, our contracts have trended down. So I, people, some pe families or otherwise, they're coming off the insurance. Maybe they're going to a spouse's plan. Maybe they're on the state plans and somewhere else, whatever it might be. Um, so given that our contracts have trended down year over year for the last five years or so, I don't, we're pretty comfortable saying we, we leave it where it is and then sort of the net in the middle. And if we're wrong, and let's say we hire the positions and every one of them comes in as family, um, reserves, that's part of why you have reserves in a self-insured plan. We can use reserves to cover in the short term and then next year we would know and we'd build that into the budget. I, I, I just have a question, similar to what you um, said, Tom, just taking a step back instead of getting specific because I, I don't, you have much more expertise in this than I do, but um, just thinking about how things have changed. Um, positions have changed and just like in business, things change, roles change. Um, I guess also the way you look at things, like things that maybe you were doing before you're no longer doing or you're using technology. Um, I'm just, I guess my question is, and, and, I, and I, I'm just really just curious. I don't mean to, I don't want to uh, doubt what you're saying at all. I'm just trying to understand. Sure. Um, as things change, is it always putting a body throwing a body at it, are there other ways mm -hmm. um, besides full-time hires, whether it's outside like a resource um, that can be provided rather than a full-time employee? Mm -hmm. So we are, we're constantly availing ourselves of outside resources. Mm -hmm. We have um, appropriate professional development um, resources and um, opportunities that we provide for our staff. It's actually something that we do very well. Um, the, but sometimes, like for a coach, um, just like I think a good example is a, uh, an assembly program or a, an evening program with a speaker, where the speaker comes, talks, everyone's there and is wowed by it and then is gone. And what do you do next? Often, this, you know, as a profession, this is something that it, coaching takes time and it takes relationships and it takes consistency. And um, it's the small iterative improvements that add up over that time with discipline practice. Um, the you know, pick your coach, right? Um, but the teams that they developed as they became the best teams were the teams that they stayed with and worked with consistently. Not, you can't take a coach out of one team, put him here for a day to have talk and then go away and then expect real improvement on the team. And that's a lot. I mean, we're building the capacity of the teachers uh, in their practice, right, professionally. And their needs are going to be at a variety of different levels and places. Um, but we, they're not exclusive, right? So we, ha we still provide those opportunities we have, uh, created partnerships, sometimes with other districts, sometimes with external partners, uh, professionally and otherwise, that have come into the district, worked with our teachers, and you know, been on a cycle that way. We actually have someone we've worked with for many years who is sort of our coach of coaches, right? And that's an outside person that we bring in to do training, and he consults with a number of different districts. Uh, and he's helped us to develop that, that coaching framework that you see, the model that we use, and all of that. So uh, we're very, very intentional about how we do this. Um, but really the, the yield, the highest <coughs> yield for these efforts is going to be um, overtime, consistency with relationships and someone who can spend the time in the classroom to really see what's going on, to understand our program, understand the kids, understand the teacher, and find the highest leverage uh, instructional moves for that teacher to make to improve their practice. So, I mean, I, I understand. Um, it's... One thing about education, we are, it's a people business. This is a very people, and we're responsible for those kids from the moment <coughs> they walk on the bus to the moment they get home off the bus at the end of the day. You know, it's bus drivers, it's TAs, it's the custodians, the teachers, the, the secretaries in the office, it's the food service workers. It's, every, it's a significant operation and it is people intensive. Um, so what we're really looking at is how it's a 1.0 FTE to support K, K-4 across the three elementary schools, which one is that 60, 70, 80 teachers? You know, you're talking about a significant one person to coach that number of people, you know, in this, in this domain. So I think it's um, certainly a worthwhile investment. Obviously, it wouldn't be on the, in the budget to move forward. But those things, we're still doing those things. And, uh, and there's great opportunities through technology and otherwise. Like to, online webinars. And oh, yeah. All and we take advantage of all of those stuff. things. Uh, as we can. And I also don't want you to think that everything is additive all the time. 
I thought this is where you were going. Um, you know, are there some things that we decide maybe aren't as effective as we'd yeah, like that them was to be? Question. And we move away from them. And yeah. there absolutely is. Uh, there's plenty of things that we do. For instance, we used, used to have a program called Read 180 in the middle school. And uh, it's a great program, nothing about against it, but it wasn't um, implemented with the fidelity with which the program expects to be. And we did, it just didn't work in our schedule. We, didn't, we weren't getting the outcomes from that program that we wanted to see. And so we've since moved away from that program. We don't use it anymore. And that was a, um, you know, that's a significant investment and a significant program. And we had trained on that over, through the years. This is going back a, a little, a few years, but we do look for, um, to look across all of our programs and make decisions what works, what doesn't. The investment we've made in Orton Dillingham, I think, with our Literacy Academy is a very good example of that. You know, the, um, the Special Education Department, as we've put all of this together, and, and Bill Tesber um, in doing so, and, and Darlene before him, you know, it has one special education teacher at each of the elementary schools who's highly skilled and trained in the science of reading through the Orton Dillingham program for our kids who are struggling the most. Uh, learning to read, and it's to get them back on track, to accelerate them, to help them catch up and learn to read by the end of third grade so that they're on the right trajectory. That was um, a very specific, targeted, intentional approach in SILAS. And so this budget has 1.0 FTE for that special education teacher to fit, complete that implementation. Um, we started with one proof of concept, you know, have some data around that. This year we have two, again, proof of contact, concept and whatever, and Bill will be presenting to the Board of Education at our next meeting to give them an update on Literacy Academy um, and the success that we've had there. And then we, you know, we keep going from there. So we try to be very intentional and iterative in what we do. Uh, instead of saying we want to hire three math coaches, one at each elementary school, we say, let's, let's bring one in, follow the concept that we developed with the classroom coach and uh, support it and monitor the outcomes. Thank you. Questions? I have some questions. <laughs> Would the budget season be, Dr. Lutze, if I didn't throw a few things in your way? I won't say well, I'd be disappointed. I don't think but... you finished. <laughs> oh. I don't think you, you were oh, yeah, finished I'm going sorry. through the FTEs. Oh, it's, up. it's fine. Oh. Um, if you want to just finish up. I'm, I'm happy to. So again, it's again the budget book itself has so many answers to questions. Yeah. And things so, you know that book starting on page 25 really breaks down the the puts and takes throughout, um, and the total of those new positions. But just the, you know what we just added in on the um, on that last page, sort of what's driving the FTE. And again, mm -hmm. you see it's some programmatic, legislative enrollment. A lot of it is enrollment driven, um, and that's where we're looking at the uh, you know, 2.4 at SACS and in those pieces. And then in the bottom is the move from the grants over. And those are really driven by pro programmatic needs, whether the reading specialist or the uh, mental health needs around um, social work for our kids. There was a question about the Elm Street management fee. So I did, that's definitely wanna just touch base on that. So you may or may not be aware, uh, the, when the town purchased 220 Elm, you know, they bought the first floor and then a private um, New Canaan resident bought the, t the second floor. And there's a condominium agreement. So that it was condoized, if that's a word, right? Um, and so these are the common charges that we pay as, you know, as the town pays. And then we do it as a pass through. So we pay the town who pays the condo association or however, however that works. Um, the, it covers the heat, the electric, the cap, <laughs> cap, it builds up a capital reserve for it. the roof is going to need to be replaced and other things, just like any cond condominium association would. Um, it also includes our cleaning fee. So I think it's about 130,000 or so for the condo fees and the rest are, so that is the day-to-day -day cleaning that we need to do in that space you know, for us. Um, it's plowing, it's landscaping, it's all of those things. So the, the biggest costs though are those big drivers of heating and electricity and the capital you know, things. So if we were to just say take over plowing, you might save $1,000 or maybe it's even 10,000, but nothing, um, of significant impact here, and you would lose that um, sort of third party responsibility to make sure that that stuff gets done. Like, we don't plow as a school on the Board of Ed. We have snow blowers that we use on the walkways, but the rest around the schools is done by the town. Um, but it's that it, it is the condominium agreement that spells out the responsibilities of the two owners. And so you'd really be renegotiating that entire condominium agreement, which. Uh, when, made, when does that expire? How long is the oh, terms of that condominium agreement? Do you know by any chance? I don't know that it does. I, yeah. I really. Oh, it's indefinite? I don't know. <laughs> I, I'd be glad to check. I, yeah, if it's curious. not indefinite, it's it, probably it, a very long time. 
It sounds like um, the town could perhaps help with some of the services to bring down the cost, but I understand it's a contract at this point. It is. Yeah, yeah you think it may be 20? Might be 20. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I know. I mean, because it's in the arrangement and as the deal was put together and all those things. I mean, there's a private owner at the top, so I don't, I don't know that he would want um, the association agreement to expire, right? Because I don't, you know, I don't know. I don't know those details. Okay. Um, I think that's a question for the board of yeah. commissioners. Yeah, thank you. Sure, of course. Oh, uh, okay. So uh, my question is a little bit more generally, generally focused, and more theoretical. But before we get to that, so you, your answer to number 58, hmm. uh, you talk about, um, if I want to look at it quickly, just for the benefit of anyone listening out there. The question is, uh, considering it is a reval year and residents are concerned about increased local taxes, it would be remiss of us not to ask, uh, understanding that by statute, we cannot direct line item cuts to the BOE budget. If the council were to ask you to cut an additional 150,000 to 200,000, from where would those cuts come? Headcount, ISF set aside, uh, SPED or other programs. And I'm not going to read the entire answer, but I will read the, the first uh, first two lines. The BOE has reduced the budget request by 1. Uh, 130, well, whatever, $1.1 $1 .1 million thus far this budget season. 630000 has been reduced from the capital, and another 500000 has been reduced from the operating budget. Before I, I get to my more broad-based question, can you just very quickly talk about the reduction on the capital, what was reduced, and what was reduced on the operating? Sure, glad to. Uh, on the capital side, one of... Two of the items were a replacement of the PA system at Sachs and the high school. Um, they, the systems are old. They're not, they, they work just fine, but they're not, um, they don't give you all the functionality that a new system would give. And actually, I say they work just fine, but they don't really do what the principals would like them to do. Uh, in part at Sachs, they'd like to be able to zone out the rooms more. When, if you've been in meetings at the Wagner Room, um, at certain passing periods, music will start coming over the loudspeaker in the middle of a meeting or what have you. So we'd like to, they'd like more uh, control over that and the music doesn't sound very good regardless of the song because of the quality <laughs> of the speaker. So they were looking at making some changes there and also looking to make sure every area is covered for safety and things. So there's good reasons that they wanted to do that. Um, in conversation with them, we made the decision to, def to push that off and defer it so that we actually have an opportunity to meet with uh, an external partner and see if we're going to make such a significant investment in the PA system, is there a way to leverage it so that we also improve the sound quality instructionally in each of our classrooms? Because there's a, a body of research that talks to the importance of clear, clear communication in a classroom for student learning, that it helps not just students who might have auditory processing challenges, but every student in, uh, benefits by having an amplified sound system in a classroom. So we wanna see um, what that might be and what it might look like for us at the high school and at the middle school. Um, and it's the kind of system where a teacher might be wearing a lanyard with a mic around their neck as they're talking. They might have another mic that goes to the kids as they're, you know, when they're speaking to the class, whatever it might be. And that's what we have to learn more about. But we thought, since we're talking about such a significant investment, let's make sure that we are bringing forward something that will benefit uh, or at least pursue looking into whether or not this program that will benefit our kids in the classroom as well. Uh, so that, that, you know, cause that's really for us, that's the crux of all of it. So that's why, so that's 630, uh, we said, let's put that aside. It was, um, I don't remember the numbers offhand, but they're both summed up between 280 and 350, 280, and 350. 350 the high school, 280 over at Sachs. On the uh, operating <coughs> side, um, really a couple of different spots as we looked at that. One was some um, good news around insurance. So we, we talked with Joe, worked with him, and said, you know, we, we're, given where we are, we're comfortable reducing that request where we are by about $250,000. Um, and so that's really the ISF deposit. Get, again, we had, um, uh, we're down one month of trend as we get closer, so that helps with your overall cost and, uh, and the performance of the plan. And we had a little bit of give also, if we had to, with the um, IBNR versus the reserve. And so we were comfortable taking that risk, saying that things should hopefully improve in, in February as we look at it. So let's assume a 250 reduction there. And the other was the uh, turnover savings. So when we built the budget, we only knew of a handful of people that were planning to retire. Now where we are today, we have eight in hand. So we're comfortable 
take adding another, what did we add to that? Another 250? 250. Yeah, 250 in the return over. That was already 350. So it's a very high number around the turnover savings, but given with eight turnover, eight in hand, we're comfortable saying doing that. So those, that's where the 500 came from. Uh, and then they did add back in, as you know, the school social worker position uh, over at Sachs, which was, we put 68 for that. 68, mm -hmm. so net 432. So yeah, it's a net 432, but it was, you know, again, puts and takes. But that was the, the approach. Uh, when we do this work, as we mentioned, it's, we always try to keep it <coughs> as far from the classroom as possible. That's why we look at the operational costs, we look at insurance, we look at turnover, we look at um, other opportunities that might be out there. Um, we do, we press pretty, pretty hard when we build the budget because um, we also want to be true to all, all of you and, and the Board of Finance, the Board of Ed, the Board of Selectmen, um, when we bring this forward. You know, we don't put something in here and say, okay, this is what we'll cut if we have to cut something. Um, that's why we look at things like the uh, turnover savings and otherwise and the insurance and continue to monitor it. Now, I will say if we have good feedback from Joe on the most recent um, projections, which we'll have him do prior to your vote, I think you're voting next week. Is it a week from today? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we'll ask him two to- weeks. No. Two weeks. Two weeks. Okay, that's helpful. Because a week would be a bit tight. Um, we'll ask them between now and then to take another look at everything and see if there's more opportunity there. And if there is, um, you know, we would let you know prior to your vote, which we've done in the past to say good news, you know, X amount is available in the ISF, um, thanks to you know, some, some improvement of performance and maybe it's the, uh, the bid that is going to go out of the pricing of the um, individual stop loss, things like that. So we'll make sure we run the whole thing, thing through top to bottom before you vote to see if there's any additional savings there. Thank you. I appreciate you, you, you kind of giving the insight on how you're developing your budget. I know you always do. And I think um, this is also what I'm about to say, um, I think applies also Chairman Alves in the BOE's perspective. So, you know, to, to let, you know, a lot of people know a secret how when we negotiate, when I negotiate union contracts or, you know, major, um, you know, like an M&A deal or things of that nature, or really any type of a negotiation. And I'm not, there's no implication here. I'm not implying you do this or the board does this at all. But a common tactic in any negotiation is you always walk in knowing, I'm going to put a number on the table. It's absolutely not my number. I will re recede from that. We will horse trade down, and it will give the sense to the other side that I'm giving. They're doing the same thing to me, and we're both looking like we're being reasonable. And then, you know, when we announce the settlements of the union contract or the, and the like, they have to sell it to their membership. I have to sell it to, you know, the, the, the C-suite people, whatever the deal is. And it looks like on the surface that there was actual real, you know, there, there were cuts and there were, was real bargain for exchange. Um, even though, and I mean, this is just the way it is, you're always walking in saying, I know I'm just gonna get rid of these things. I don't care, I'll, I'll concede it, it's no big deal. I think you've already started to address that point, but even from the Board of Ed standpoint, when, when you guys are, are interfacing with Dr. Lutze, and I think it's important for, the, for everyone out in the town, the 22,000 residents that we have, and you know, a lot of them don't have kids in the school, but we all understand the value of the school system and the value it brings to the town and, and, and property, among other things. There's a lot of intangibles there. But for the, all of the taxpayers to understand, and again, I think you've gone very far in explaining it already, is that that is not what happens with the Board of Ed budget. That's right. That you're walking in saying, and you said it before, you're pressing very hard on what can be pressed on. It is not a matter of I'm walking into this budget season knowing uh, this PA system. That's all. You know, that's not, I know I'm not going to you know move forward on that anyway. So I'm going to give it to them, and it looks like a cut. And you know, and maybe the uninitiated would say, "Wow, that's right. That's great. You know, it makes perfect sense why he's not moving forward." But in reality, you knew I knew I wasn't going to going to go on ahead and implement that. So, and again, there's no implication. Yep. That's why I'm very happy what I'm hearing, but. I just think it's important because people do say, eh, you know, this Board of Ed budget, it always increases. They're always adding headcount. Is it, you know, when is it too much? <laughs> when are we getting to too much? And I think it's important. And I think if you both could respond that the assurance to everybody out there, that is not what we do, that we do push hard on it. And then there's a, a follow-up question I'm gonna have. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, I totally appreciate that. But when I ran for the Board of Ed two and a half years ago for the first time, we ran, uh, you know, I wanna say almost exclusively on that, but it was a big piece of what we ran on. And we heard from the community that they just felt that the Board of Ed budget had been just ballooning and getting bigger and bigger. Um, and 
in Little Canada, my kids are my kids are pretty young, so I didn't have any direct experience. Um, and we came in uh, with a fresh board of ed, fresh set of eyes. And the first year it was like drinking out of a fire hose. So didn't really necessarily know what we were looking at, but spent a whole lot of time uh, going through it. And Dr. Lutzi and his staff have been super helpful in helping us understand all the acronyms, which I <laughs> hope to God I never actually <laughs> learn all of. Um, but uh, but then second year in, third year in, I got to tell you, it's a pretty well-oiled machine. Um, and look, I'm in finance and I spend all day with clients trying to find money for them to be able to save for the future. And this is um, it's an important part of what we do. And I'm also a taxpayer. And, you know, I can safely say, I mean, I, I could comfortably and confidently say that I, I look forward to paying my taxes this time every single year because I've got three kids that are really benefiting from a tremendous school system and a beautiful community. Uh, I'm not just saying that. I tell everybody that. So um, maybe I'm the wrong person to ask, but uh, I have, I'm very, very confident, as is the rest of our board um, in the budget that Dr. Watson and his cabinet put forth. Um, and uh, even the PA system, like, I, I didn't really know why we needed a new PA system. It seemed pretty expensive. I mean, I have an AV guy I could have introduced him to that probably would have been a little bit cheaper. But uh, we asked some questions. And I think that that, you know, as part of that process, Dr. Lutze did what we promised he was going to do and went back. And, and it wasn't just about sharpening the pencils about determining, like, is this really the right thing to move forward with right now? And in that research, he came up with you know, the, you know, the idea that maybe we could do something even bigger and better. Now, it might be more expensive, and maybe we don't go that route, but I think what we learned is that it just required some more research. So you know, if we're going through and cutting things, and this question says, if you're just going to kind of arbitrarily cut something, I wouldn't say that was arbitrary, but we don't have all the details that we need yet. It's a big ticket item, and it's something that we're not hurting the product. We're not hurting the kids. And um, I think that's ultimately the most important thing. And in the three years that I've been here, it's not a long time, but that's how I view the decisions that, that Dr. Lutze and his cabinet make. It's like, what's the, what's the ultimate end result here? Um, and is this gonna hurt the kids or is it gonna help the kids? Um, I hope that's helpful, but that's- uh, It is, thank you. Yep. You're the perfect person to answer that question. Thank you. Oh. There's, uh, <laughs> Thank you. You did good. there's, there's, yeah, no, it's perfect. So there's, there's, I'm glad to, um, you know, keep going, but there's not a heck of a lot more to add. Uh, I would share that the trend of our budget has um, been at or slightly below inflation as we looked at it over the last couple of years. So we do understand that, you know, the numbers do look like, do go up. That does happen. Um, it is, there are, it's 82% salaries and benefits as those drivers move, move the needle. Um, but I also think it's important to look at it in, in context. So there, there are 43 districts that spend more per pupil than we do. There's not a single district in the state that gets better outcomes. And I think that that's important. And that speaks to our stewardship of the resources that we receive every year, our, the investments, the strategy that we use to invest that money. Um, and the decisions we make, along with the Board of Education and the administration and others in, in how we're doing this work. So it's, um, I think there's an argument to be made around uh, inputs and outputs. And I would say that the efficiency rating there of you know, being 44th and per pupil, but number one in outcomes is something that most folks would, uh, would be quite proud of, and we are. So my follow-up question, and I wanna get you guys off the stand here. Um, uh, sorry, the uh, famous. Um, <laughs> it's so, it's so the stand. I see you sweating. <laughs> You're just warming up. I know, right? Here it comes. No, um, my best off, yeah. yeah, right. <laughs> if I had one of those lights, then I could I know, pull I from the ceiling and put it right on. Lights and just have it right on. It. Um, so, like my, um, you you just said what I've been talking about now for however many years I've been on town council, right? The 82% of the board's budget is locked up in labor contracts, right? You have right. two now that you have to start negotiating. The, the teachers and I think the assistants, right, are coming up in this June. June 2025 yep. are the yep. two contracts that are coming up. And food services. And food, service, and yeah. food services. I think custodian, I don't know, you want we an just, extension on that? We just, or? Finished we just finished the custodians, so that's locked in until 26. Okay, and I think and then next summer we do the administrators. They're right. a year behind the teachers, right? So uh, you know, and municipal union contracts are kind of a different, a very different animal from um, private sector. Nevertheless, sure. I think you always do a fantastic job of explaining, you know, the FTE, the headcount versus student um, uh, uh, headcount. And to me, and again, I've said this repeatedly, you know, when you're talking, and this goes for the town budget as well, you know, 82% of the board's budget is locked up in labor contracts. So, so you're dealing with 
a really small slice of the pie that there can be actually any meaningful discretionary control over. Right? And, and I think when you said, look, we push real hard on that, mm -hmm. I think you do. I, 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 I mean, I believe, I know you do. So the question becomes, you know, explaining that we get the value for the right headcount that you're at. Uh, you're making that call and you've deemed it in your judgment that's what's required and that's great. So the question then becomes, what can we do better to lower the, 80, the, the cost on that 82 percent, right, without cutting the headcount? And I know it's extremely difficult. I've been at the bargaining table for 20 years. So I, I know it's very difficult. And what's even worse in the public sector is the fact of how it works out when you come to an impasse. Mm -hmm. It's not so easy where you, know, you can go on strike and that whole, it's a very different process. You go to arbitration and then the arbitrator, for those who don't understand this, they get presented with the union's best and final and the district's best and final proposal on their economics. And the arbitrator has no ability to split babies. He just decides based on a couple of different factors. I'm either going with the union's best and final or the district's best and final. And for me, I mean, from being in the private sector, I mean, that is like unbelievable that that's how that works. But that's how it works. And that significantly ties the district's hands, especially in a community like New Canaan, right? Because essentially, and I'm sorry I'm going on a little bit, but as you can all imagine, in a private sector, when you represent a company and you go to the bargaining table with the union, the, the employer is always saying, oh, we're doing terrible. Here's my books and records. You know, we just can't afford an increase. You know, in fact, we may have to reduce and we can't give extra, you know, uh, for a, a pension or medical. Um, and you're just going to have to work with us. That's how it is in the private sector. And in, in, in this, it's very different. So when we have a community like New Canaan, it's difficult explaining to a, an arbitrator, we can't afford it. And that's the tough spot. And I get that. Nevertheless, if we can't reduce headcount because that could impact students' um, performance, which no one wants that, my question is, is, is that, well, it's not more of a question you probably can answer right now. It's more of a consideration for all of us here, for the Board of Finance, for the Board of Selectmen, for the entire town to understand if we can't reduce headcount, how can we manage the cost of these contracts in a better way and I get the fact that it, you know, you're looking at other towns and comparing what Darien does in Westport and, and all of our comparators, comparators. But to me, it would seem that if we want to truly wring better savings out, if we can, is at the bargaining table rather than trying to tinker around the edges the best we can with that, you know, 18% uh, of the budget. To me, that's that's where the real savings for the board potentially could be found. And it's not going to be easy. And I, I'm, I know that every contract negotiation, there's an effort to do that. But to me, that's where I would look to really, truly find. It's not efficiencies. It's a, it's some type of savings through whether it's the step system, through it's whatever that could be. That's to me is where I think it would is more fertile ground. And I don't know if you think that's remotely achievable. Um, in the future here. I mean, if you want to just sure. quickly comment, you're not the yeah. Um, well, just and to build off a little bit what you said, then get to the, the question a bit. Um, so our contracts, there are two different groups. Our certified folks use the Teacher Negotiation Act, the TNA. Our non-certified are MURA, Municipal Employee Relations Act. Um, the way that the TNA is structured, so we have a no-strike law around yeah. that, right? So fortunately in Connecticut, our teachers can't go on strike. But we also have binding arbitration. So that's what you're talking about. And right now, the um, and they're looking to actually change this, but right now, if you go to arbitration because you hit an impasse and you're not able to settle the contract, then each side picks an arbitrator and then those two arbitrators pick a neutral and then you are you put on your case and you're exactly right about last best offer. Um, so there's a lot of strategy around what's still on the table, what's come off the negotiating table, what goes forward into arbitration, all of that. We have gone to arbitration with our teachers before. Uh, we did it three contracts ago. Uh, and it was really a, a disagreement over the insurance. We felt strongly that we wanted a copay after the deductibles reached. Um, they felt strongly that they didn't. And so we went to arbitration with that. And in the second or third year, I believe, of the contract, it was put in place where we had that um, the copay after the deductible. Uh, it's been in ever since, and we've kept that. And since then, we knew one of the reasons we um, felt so strongly about it was that we wanted it for all of our bargaining groups. So since then, it's gone into every one of our plans with all of our bargaining groups, which is why it saves us a little over $400,000 a year um, just in plan design 
you know, charges. So there are some things that, some reasons to go to arbitration. One of the challenges in arbitration, which you touched on, is by statute, the arbitrators have to look at ability to pay. Not willingness to pay, but ability to pay. And our ability to pay places us typically second, third in the state. Um, so we're, we're not in a great starting position when we go to arbitration. So we are, um, so we have to be strategic, and we are. I will say that with the insurance and other things, our teachers are good partners. They really are. And they want to get to a place where um, it's going to work for everybody. Of course, it's still a union negotiation. Uh, we have mature contracts, so we really do look at the economics more than anything else. Um, there may be a little tinkering here and there with some tuition reimbursement. Maybe those levels change a little bit here and there based on what the, what the rates are. And there was a question last time about coaching and coaching salaries and those, the coaching amounts haven't changed in years and years because generally the folks around the table are not the ones on the field. So that's something that like we feel strongly needs to be looked at and considered because you know, we, want, we need to make sure we stay competitive there. Um, the, the Teacher Negotiation Act also um, expects us to invite someone from the Board of Finance to join us. So at our last negotiation, uh, Chairman Laviari was with us the whole time and was a part of those negotiations and I think went well. I'm going to be reaching out to him again to see if he or somebody else wants to come. And then once that um, the, un the contract is ratified by the, the employees and by the school district, then it comes to the town council and you have an opportunity. You don't vote to accept or to approve, but you can vote to reject becomes the option. So years ago, the town council started to make a motion to vote not to reject. <laughs> um, yeah, double negative there. But um, whatever, however, we'll talk, however we want to manage that. The negotiations will be in the summer, and then it'll be not for the 24-25 school year, but it'll lock in for the 25-26. And they really, they build the calendar of dates around um, when negotiations can start, when you go to mediation, and when you go to arbitration on the date in which the budget is presented to the Board of Finance. So they start with that and then work backwards to create your calendar so that you can finish in time to build the budget and have it in front of the town based on whatever that new contract is. So it's a pretty compressed timeline that will start over the summer as we go through. Uh, but there are, we, we, now to the second part of the question, there are some opportunities you have to, um, it takes some, some creative thinking. I'm gonna share one with you. Um, in the last negotiation, we saw a pattern. What was happening was we generally haven't moved our step schedule. Generally, a starting teacher has been making the same amount through the years. So on year three of the contract, a brand new teacher would make the same as a new teacher would have made three years before that. And that, you know, there's pros and cons there. But we, we left that step schedule the same as folks moved through. And then just the last step was getting a GWI. So everyone on the last step might go up 2%. 2%, 2% over the course of the contract. Well, when you, we went back into negotiations, you had a super step. So everyone on the penultimate step would then make a pretty big jump. It could have been $12,000, it could have been more, to get to that top step. And every year, every time we negotiated, we were putting in a new step and splitting the steps and the grid was getting longer. And yeah, but the same problem kept happening again. again. So what we negotiated with the union was uh, instead of moving the step, just allow folks to go off step and have them get their GWI so that somebody who gets to the top step in the first year of the contract, they might get 2% per year. Someone who gets to the top step in the third year of the contract will also just get 2% instead of getting 6% compounded as they go. So, you with me? No. no. Oh, <laughs> I, oh, I, was, I tried. <laughs> you should start over. Should I take it from, yeah. take yeah. It from the top? No. All right, long and short of it is, um, we had a set schedule. No, the numbers didn't move in the step schedule, except for the top step kept going up. And then if in the last year, if you're on the second, the penultimate step, it'd be a 6% increase plus a compounded yeah. that year last year. We said, that's not right. So why don't they just right. get a GWI and go off step? So you're sort of creating a new step schedule that's 2% yes, each right. year instead it. of allowing the top step to sort of float away from the rest of the grid. Yeah. Um, it, they were very happy with it because wow. they, um, they always had a question about why is somebody who you know, say is 10 years less experienced making as right. much as someone, yeah. you know, what? And um, we like it because it's more predictable and, right. and we're not, you know, so I think that will say that 
will save us over time. It takes years, you know, as you're going through, as folks are moving through, but it will save us over time in the, um, in the total cost of our salaries. And I don't know of other districts doing that. Um, so so those, we're trying to be creative and thinking of ways that, if, if that makes sense. Also, it's becoming more competitive, right, to get qualified teachers. Oh my gosh. So, I mean, I, I'm just thinking it's only gonna, it's, and, and you know, it's, we want, we want qualified, we want the best. Oh, teachers. absolutely. So that's why I'm very, that's why I'm being more, or applying more scrutiny to extra body, you know, extra added mm -hmm. body that we put in, because I, I, I know that to keep the great teachers we have and to attract great teachers that, that mm -hmm. we want to come in, we are going to have to pay a little more as years go sure. on because the demand sure. is higher and the supply is lower. So that's, that's why I'm really pressing on mm -hmm. the, you know, every mm -hmm. edition, every edition. Oh yeah. Program. Well, and again, because we I don't want to yeah. chintz out on the, you know, no. I, they, we want good teachers. Yeah, well, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, everything we do, it, all of our, our positions, our work, everything exists in service to what happens in our classroom right. with our teachers and kids. And I just, for what it's worth, as you can imagine, all negotiations exist in a greater context, both education in Connecticut and nationally and otherwise. So both the, inf the inflation rates and what we're looking at around there, that coming down, that should help us. Hopefully the trend continues to move in the right direction around inflation and other things, but that you know, the general context is also uh, informative to negotiations as we go into them. So, uh, Thank you for the explanation. I think it was important for, I think, everyone to understand that explanation. So um, are there any other questions for Dr. Lutze, Chairman Alves? I, I'd like to follow up on some of the yeah. stuff Mike was saying just briefly. So besides the stepwise increase and in how salary is negotiated in terms of the health care costs, hmm. are there, is there wiggle room there that you can change the benefits without making it unattractive to be a teacher? Like, I don't know mm -hmm. if you do co-insurance, you do co-pays. Is co-insurance also part of the insurance plan? Not co-pays. What we do is um, we're a high deductible plan. Mm -hmm. So we, they have HSAs. Right. Um, so there is a premium share that they pay and they 20, 21 percent of premium and the district pays the 79 percent. There are some plan design changes that we look at every negotiations and they've been great partners with us in that. Um, the you know, so we'll look at the amount of our um, deductibles. We'll look at the, you know, the HSA and the funding of the HSA. We'll look at um, you know, what the out-of-pocket maximums are and things like that. And those are all levers that we can look at. Unfortunately, so there were, there was pretty big savings when we moved into the high deductible plan because we were in a traditional copay plan before that, um, a PPO. And then, and the move over that transition saved us an awful lot of money, um, to the tune over, over 10, $12 million over the course of the last 10 years. Um, but those, those big savings, those big rocks, I, they've all happened, right? We've, uh, we've pulled those levers. So now it is a little bit of tinkering. And we are talking to Cigna about, are there other sort of other things out there? What's on the horizon that we're seeing? And more than Cigna, I mean, we're doing our research to see um, what other plan designs, what else might there be that could be that next step. You know, years ago, nobody imagined a high deductible plan would be appropriate for everybody. We're all in the co-pays with the PPO. And now we're all here. So mm -hmm. what's that next thing? We're, we're working to try to figure that out. So like the cost of prescriptions that's going, I, I remember hearing that at the Board of Finance meeting that that's <coughs> one of the things that's driving costs. People get very yeah. expensive drugs. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if that can be factored in somehow to the health plan of, is, if, if, to account for that in some way, mm -hmm. because it just is going through, the, just because medicine is, is just uh, driving that, right? It is, and, and for a good reason, right? I mean, people are living longer, they're more productive, they're able to keep working with illnesses that would have taken them out of work and et cetera, you know, in years past. <coughs> um, but yeah, we're looking, at, we're looking at behavioral components around some of the medications as well. Mm -hmm. You know, so if it's a medication that's addressing a symptom, mm -hmm. can we get go deeper around behavioral health and changing of behavior and other things so that that symptom is no longer there and needs to be remedied. So we're doing some work around that, certainly. So like a proactive approach. Yep, so we'll, based upon medications that are prescribed, um, Cigna will reach out, the nurses will make calls, they'll reach out for some you know, talk, counseling discussions, some, some proactive work that way. Mm -hmm. um, we also do, of course, we cover all of the uh, preventative care work and everything else with mm -hmm. folks. Um, but yeah, it's it's a re very challenging marketplace for healthcare. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> thank you, Dr. Lutze. Thank you, Chairman Alves. Appreciate the time. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. All right. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Thank Thanks, you. All right. Okay. Moving along. Let's have uh, the health department up for twenty minutes. <coughs>
Don't be ashamed of me. <laughs> You're lucky I love you. <laughs> I forgot to see now it is. Sorry, please go ahead. The floor is yours. Okay, I'm Jen Ielson. I'm the director of health. So I'll start with our mission statement. It's the mission of the health department to control preventable diseases through education, inspections, and monitoring by enforcing federal, state, and local codes, laws, and regulations for maintaining and promoting public health. The 10 essential public health services by Connecticut general statute, every health department has to provide a basic health program. The state health department has adopted the national 10 essential public health services as its statutory model. Summary of major health department responsibilities, responsible for carrying out and enforcing all aspects of the Connecticut Public Health Code. We license and inspect all food service establishments hair and nail salons, all cosmetology businesses, public pools, which includes condo and um, a club pool, septic and refuge trucks, private wells, daycares, lead inspections, septic inspections, and soil testing. We review all building permits for properties on septic and or private wells. We're responsible for all public health emergency preparedness, CDC required deliverables. We provide case management for um, all New Canaan children that have elevated blood lead levels of 3.5 micrograms per deciliter or greater. We manage infectious diseases and we provide written comments for review of all PNZ and inland wetland applications for properties on septic and or commercial properties. And we also respond to various landlord tenant disputes, which those oh, are always that's fun. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Where'd that come from? Um, <laughs> These are just health department staffing requirements of uh, the degrees and all the licenses and certifications that are required, um, which is why there's still a public health shortage nationwide and in Connecticut. Luckily, I have my staff fully staffed, so we are not short staffed. Um, major changes. Um, the biggest thing was we implemented open gov thanks to um, the special appropriation by Board of Finance last year, and not having to wait till July 1, we were able to launch November 1st, which was huge. I was um, project manager of that project. It's our first year utilizing it. It's been um, going great. I'll get into some slides with analytics. Um, legislature that passed um, in 2022 was the unfunded mandate. Um, requiring health departments to provide QPR, which is question, persuade, refer, suicide prevention trainings. That has been implemented and began July 1st of 2023. We do monthly QPR suicide prevention trainings at um, the library and sometimes at the Y, and those are full every month, which is great. And we also mm -hmm. do um, training of staff at the library, the Y, and any other organization. Um, the unfunded mandate does come with costs, obviously, of purchasing the booklets and the updated PowerPoints and such. These are just some OpenGov analytics from November 1st when we launched to March 14th, which is last week. So this gives you of what the system has taken in. This is not the revenue of July, August, September, October, which is not part of this. So this is the revenue, the 634,000 that's come in in just the four and a half months through the system, through health building, P and Z, wetlands and um, engineering. And to put it in perspective, when I presented this to the Board of Finance on February 5th, this number was 412,000. Wow. So in a matter of you know six, six, five weeks, it's already gone up. And 
November, December, January are our dead season. Mm. So, you know, yeah. and we already got crushed in February, so it's a little scary what's about to happen to us in the spring. But, you know, it has been working out great and getting that payment up front instead of the way it used to be done um, is obviously making a huge difference in revenue. Has that freed up any of your time? Is it, is it, I know no, it's, it's actually process. created more time because now, like before, a lot of permits were, a lot of departments were being skipped, even though statutorily we couldn't be skipped and they were doing what they call over the counter permits which you're not supposed to do. Now they can't do that because I we can see everything. It's so transparent and I watch it like a hawk and I click on, no, that needs to get reviewed by X, Y, and Z. So, um, it's but it's been great. Work. All the contractors <laughs> love it. They can submit 24 seven, you know, they don't need to come. Time is money with contractors, yeah. you know? And as you see by the numbers, before we only took paper check, like like I said, back in the 80s style. So now with credit, credit cards been the number one thing, people like to get the miles or points, et cetera. So that's been the number one thing. Um, the permit count, I just wanna make a note. That's of our individual standalone permits. So for like the health department, for example, the 254 is just my health department permits, not the permits I reviewed for building department, because those are technically the building mm. department's permits. But then the account numbers here break it down by revenue. So when we pull the spreadsheet, it has all the revenue of what department and for what line item. So it's very transparent what account number, it go, what permit number it goes to, what address it goes to. And then if anyone tries to manipulate something in OpenGov and waive your fee or move your fee, it time sta stamps, date stamps, and says who did it. So, better, better, so there is no better accountability. You know, before where yeah. it's, oh, I didn't do it. Yeah, well, no, yeah. we know exactly <laughs> who did it. Yeah. So I love it because it's very That's transparent. Great. I'm a little neurotic, so I like okay. to track things with data. I like neurotic. <laughs> right? like, that's, um, absolutely. Grants, um, we're in the middle of the immunization grant right now. Um, that grant, the total amount was 48,156. 30,870 of that was to cover um, my nurses. The 17,286 was required to be used for a media campaign. Greg Riley, our grant writer, helped me write the RFP. We put that out. He helped me interview all the media companies. Surprisingly, we had like 11 or 12 submit, which I was kind of shocked that many submitted. And we're in the midst of that. Um, we selected the vendors. Um, we selected two, each at 8,500 each. That runs to the end of March 31st. And then that portion of it's done. The grant runs through um, June 30th of um, this year and then July 1, we'll pick up the other grant, the Workforce Development Grant, to continue funding um, the nurse through the next year. So we don't have to worry for this budget year of that. And that's another 45,030. And the difference with the Workforce Development Grant, that money's being front loaded and sent a check all at once, where the other grants I have to submit through Core CT, the State Comptroller's database and you get the reimbursement and you have to submit literally every single piece of paper from timesheets to what pen you bought, I mean, it's, which is, I guess, good as a taxpayer to know they're making sure it's done correctly. Um, emergency preparedness, this is another grant that we receive um, called the FEP grant. That's $11,708. That allows me to hire my part-time coordinator, Nick, to assist me. Um, with keeping all the plans up to date, you know, going to all the month, there's several monthly meetings that I'm required to go to. So if I can't go, I can send Nick. It equates to four hours a week to have him. The state has just confirmed that the new budget cycle starting July 1, that we will get another five year grant of the exact same amount of money, um, at which time then I'll probably have to go for BOS because it's over 10,000, but. So at least we know that's coming. If we weren't gonna get that grant, it would just go back to the way it used to be where I did all that it would just be more on my plate. So I'm happy to get that back. 
Um, Nick um, also wrote our Region 1 Volunteer Reception Center plan. Um, that plan came out of discussions with Newtown and everything they went through with, you know, people kind of self-deploying. Everyone wants to help, but you kind of just show up and kind of creates anarchy kind of thing. Uh, we were supposed to have an exercise tonight about that at Norwalk City Hall, but when we got the new deliverables, um, we saw that we had extra full-scale exercise needed, so now we've postponed it to July to get credit for the next, you know, cycle, so we don't have to, you know, do it again. We're doing a training on April 24th, um, trauma response training with our Fairfield County trauma response team. Our old EMS captain, Bonnie Romilly, is um, part of that great team and helped start that team. Um, there's a crisis and risk communication social media training that we've planned for May 14th as well. Um, these are the CDC capabilities that public health is specifically responsible for. And then from these capabilities, they tell you how many tabletop exercises, how many full scale exercises, and what plans they want updated every year. Um, some new community health programming we've been doing. Um, we did free skin cancer screenings with um, New Canaan resident, um, Connecticut dermatologist, Dr. L. DeMole in October at Irwin Park. Uh, Shannon's dad um, is the chief building official in Greenwich. He actually built the booths out of our old vaccine booths for the screenings. Um, and we're gonna be doing another one in June um, at Schoolhouse Apartments um, for them. Um, and like I said, the QPR suicide trainings we do every single month. The next one is April 19th. Are those open to the public or is it? The QPR? Or, yes. Yeah, they, the library sends them out through their listserv because they have a much broader base. I mean, once we get ours up and running, um, Deanna has her newsletter now yeah. going out. And then what Russ is working on is health, police, fire, and public works will have their newsletters too and then the public will be able to select what buckets they want who they want updates from so it'd be kind of like during covid when we were winding down people got to opt in to whether you want it or not um, and then it will go out through everbridge and with the same kind of template and then we also do um did several TikToks with dr ruskowski again another new canaan resident that helps us out the skin cancer screening was great. I did it. Oh, it was good. Because I hadn't had time to make an appointment, and I was like, I'll just go to this if I can get a spot. And it was it's so, it's such a great thing to provide for the community. It's nice to check that off the list. Yeah. So I, I was really pleasantly surprised um, that it was offered, and it was a great service. I missed that. Highly recommend. <laughs> ten out of ten. No notes. And some other community health programming we've started um, post COVID. Now that we have, you know more time, well, not exactly more time, but we're not COVID crazy anymore. Um, we do a lot of talks um, on various topics at the Lapham Center um, and uh, the Staying Put sponsored one of them in uh, January, which was great on a hydration talk for uh, seniors. We do diabetes wellness blood sugar screenings every two weeks at Lapham. We also do one once a month um, at the schoolhouse apartments as well with my nurse Ellen and um, Shannon uh, heart healthy event at schoolhouse we have a heart event tomorrow at Lapham we did a food allergen seminar with Dr. Ruskowski um, for parents at well, it was supposed to be at the library then the flood happened got moved to the Y and then um, we're going to be doing that again because we uh, lost a lot of registration from that moving around hectic period there um, we are also, May is Mental Health Awareness Month, so the health department is um, sponsoring, um, is holding an event at Waveney House at 11 a.m. with um, Kimberly Morgan, a board-certified APRN, and um, Devin, who's an LCSW of the Mind Well Center. That will be going out in um, Deanna's newsletter on April 4th to the community to register for that. Um, it's open to all, you know, be on um, anxiety, you know, internet and all that, all the 
stuff that's you know going on now. The New Canaan Community Foundation is sponsoring the the brunch portion of it for us, so right. it'll be a nice uh, partnership. Uh, we're also doing an Earth Day event on April 22nd at Waveney House in partnership with Robin Bates Mason and Planet New Canaan. And then in the afternoon, doing a bingo at Lapham Center as part of that. Jen, Jen can you say, um, the Lapham, um, the Friday morning weekly health coffees, are they well attended? Do you have like any? Yeah. yeah. Like box and it depends on the topic. I mean, obviously, like when you get like the hydration talk, you'll get, you know, over 30 people, mm -hmm. you know. The sleep talk we had around 20. I mean, it depends. And a lot of people just pop in. They're so used to us now, mm -hmm. especially from COVID. They know my nurse really well and they know Shannon, they know all of us. So a lot of times they'll just pop in, even if it's not a topic that they want to talk, they just want to ask questions. Mm -hmm. So it's been actually very, very nice. And February, we didn't do as much at Lapham because a lot of people, are, the seniors are away at that kind of time. Mm -hmm. They begin to come back you know, now from the winter. So um, we'll continue to do, and we ask them what they, you know, want to learn about. about and, you know, things like that. Um, obviously we still do all the vaccination stuff. We do all um, childhood immunizations as well, um, as long in, in addition to flu. COVID, we didn't do this year except the children because you would have had to have paid $169 a shot and I was not going to be asking any board to fund that. So um, here's inspection data. And just to note that the salons um, and pools are in May and June. The um, truck and septic inspections are in um, June. So those licenses will begin, we'll send out an email in May explaining OpenGov, give them all the directions, how to do it all. And um, the pools have to be not only their permit submitted and paid for, but they have to be inspected by us before they can open for the season. Um, and then uh, the salons will go through with the relicensing with them. We didn't have any issues with the restaurants. I mean, because it's different. Contractors are already using OpenGov in every other town, so they were already versed in it. I mean, it's a little harder when, you know, but everybody pretty much can figure out how to use the computer, and if not, we walk them through it. Yeah, learning, the learning curve, it'll get better. Yeah. How, um, how frequently are you inspecting restaurants? Well, by <laughs> the, no, FD, we by the FD, go, FDA code, it goes by classification. Yeah. So if you're a class four, you're inspected a minimum of four times a year. But now that they changed the FDA code, depending on what your violation was, you had to go back within three days or 10 days, where before you didn't have to go back until the next three months. So now it's actually, you know, increased Geno's having to go back more and more. So, you know, and that FDA code just passed not even a year ago. So it's time consuming when yeah. we don't have, obviously, the staff of, you know, Stanford. I'm just looking at 250 estimated for the next fiscal year. And yeah, no. What do we have, 25 restaurants in town max, maybe? Oh, no, there's 100 that are licensed. As restaurants? There's 100 the food service establishments in New Canaan. Service establishments mm -hmm. qualify as restaurants, 100. Mm -hmm. That's new. I, I had no, no idea. No, we've always, it's always been well into that time frame, there's over 40 salons for a town of well, only 20,000 people. Just, <laughs> 100 restaurant establishments. <laughs> <laughs> like nail salons and hair salons. Yeah, yeah we, we do all the all types of salons. Yeah, but you need it like the coffee shop. Um, oh. So budget wise, the, nothing really changed except the um, union. My three full-time staff are town hall union. They get a 2.75% uh raised july 1 this year and next year and then they also get an additional one percent of the 401a um, employer contribution so that's the increase mm -hmm. down below there was no increase um, the blue beam that you see the service contracts that's the program that we use to scale plans electronically when we're doing open gov permitting and then 
to offset that, I cut the office supplies down because again, we're not doing the mailing anymore or anything. So you're saving money, not having the envelopes and all that kind of jazz. So there really isn't any other big changes to that. Revenue, um, we didn't propose any increases in revenue as explained to the Board of Finance. I purposely did not increase the revenue to the building permits because I wanted to see the impact of open gov over a year. So in November is when we submit to finance department for the next year. So by then I'll see the you know true number um, and then be able to next year increase the revenue for that. Because um, like as of right now, uh, my revenue for the building permits, I'm already at 80% and it's March. So I know I'll be way over. I just don't want to guess for this budget year when I can have the better data for next year to go from it. Um, and we did increase the, the restaurant fees, I think by like $25, but all that, those fee memos were done last January and then in May, it had to be advertised for a full month. And then in July is when it went into effect. So these were literally just changed. So we didn't propose any changes again, you know, because now that COVID's over, people have kind of gone back to work and the restaurants are not as busy as they were before. So. Are you, no, I understand we can't add to your budget, certainly so, but do you feel like you are well staffed and can you ever have enough staff or is there some, maybe for planning purposes that, I don't know, do you need I, I an think, admin or something to help you with open gov and making sure that- Well, I think we're good right now because I've, when I've built this department and hired all this staff, I've made sure they've all had to get cross-trained and added all these certifications and made sure they had the degrees and everything. So we're able to keep, you know, dispersing the work around to make it work and after covid to us like anything is like the work. nothing <laughs> i mean after what we went through for three years i mean this is you know we're able to keep up with everything and the the minimal amount of overtime in the budget is for anything that they need obviously i don't get overtime so it's and the car situation is all set. Oh, finally. <laughs> yes. Good. Yes. And one of them is electric, so you don't have to worry about gas on that. That's and great. even though by statute I'm 24-7, I don't have a take-home car, so none of that's worried either. So good. we're good to go. And between the three of us that go out in the field, the two cars are fine. Great. So thank you all again for approving that too. Another one of our great capital. And this year we have no capital. Oh, no capital. No, no request. Got what you need. Yeah. We're great. I follow the rules. We're good to go. <laughs> Thank you for everything that you do. It's really remarkable. Wow. Any what other story? Oh my God. What you guys accomplish in a given year is unbelievable. Yeah. All right. Any other questions, comments, accolades? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just Bring glad, it. I'm just glad you got go, um, open gut. Yeah, open gut because you've been asking for that for so long and we've been so behind. And I'm just so glad that we did it and there's more accountability. So good for you for pushing. And you will be happy when you see the revenue. Yeah, 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 <laughs> and, to keep, and you kept pushing, which was yeah. the right thing to do. So. I was teasing Deanna this morning. We get paid the same no matter how many permits come in. So, you know. <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be great. Incentivize yeah. that. Well, thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. that. Thank you, Thanks. Thanks for everything. Okay. Thank you, guys. Uh, let's have human services up next. Okay. Hi, everybody. Hi, Hi Beth. Get on and share my screen.
just trying to share the screen. As far as I know, it's just been up to Okay. 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 Great. Well, let's do this. Oh, okay, we've been taking over, so it must be a great relief. It's, it's not it's getting over here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hang on. Share screen. Where's your account? Is it open? Is the file open? <laughs> Let's do this. No. My, <laughs> let me preface the, I had a PowerPoint, but really it, it just shows the mission statement um, and the budget. Cool. And I hope everybody saw the, is it up? We have it. We have it on our yeah. latest. Yeah, you do. Yeah, okay, go ahead. So you have it. Okay. So the mission statement, actually, uh, Human Services is a very quiet department uh, from the outside. And on the inside, we are working with people on a very confidential basis, and as well as looking at resources from outside agencies in order to meet the needs of the community as a whole. So given the budget, uh, this year, our staff has remained the same, and going to the human services agencies, uh, this year we, compared to last year, we have decreased the amount of uh, grants being awarded. Um, at the same time, we, we have maintained what definitely is needed in the community uh, for purposes that range from children, up to seniors. So we think we have a great, great balance with the get about uh, 50,000, kids in crisis 96. This will take care of the high school teen talk counselor. And you heard Dr. Lutzis talk about the additional middle school counselor that's going to be uh, taken, taking over what the kids in crisis counselor does now with the, um, at the, at SACS. So it's a great compromise and they know best how to take care of the kids. So we're going with that. Uh, New Canaan Cares is uh, 18,000. It shows eight for the budget. Uh, 10,000 will be applied to that from the opioid settlement. So that will bring it up to 18. And then we have the guidance center, child guidance center for 5,000 and the domestic violence 10,000 for the year. Uh, Meals on Wheels, 5,000, and our community wellness program that is for other mental well-being uh, requests in town, such as the vigil, things like that, to help and to help sponsor. Mm -hmm. And then the New Canaan Urgent Assessment Program, which is 50,000, uh, 25,000 of that shows on your budget, but another 25 will be added to that from the opioid settlement. Mm, great. So... That being said, uh, the total is 201,500. Uh, actual, uh, it'll be 236,500 given the other input from the opioid, 35,000 from the opioid settlement, which we, we have that money now and uh, we can direct it towards the remediation uses, which definitely New Canaan Cares uh, and the Urgent Assessment Program definitely qualify. So, definitely. yes. Uh, the four grants that uh, were cut, uh, did that result in the, in the reduction of any direct services to 
uh, your, your clients or? No, not di uh, direct services. They, some will not be able to come on site, but that's okay. I mean, there is Zoom and things like that. Um, and the amount of money we get, I don't know per person. They, the, these other agencies can pay for assistance that the town uh, is not uh, allowed to pay for, such as they can't pay ahead, like first month's rent and security. I mean, last month's rent and security, but an agency uh, that, that gets uh, for other grants from the state, they're allowed to pay forward like that. But as a municipality, we do not. So that helps people such as a single mom who was just newly divorced, needs an apartment, they want their child to stay in the New Canaan school system, and it's a lot of money to put out front when they don't have it. So this is why these other agencies come in. What, what did you mean they can't come on site? What does that mean? Oh, so we have some of the counselors from these agencies would come on site and uh, come in uh, for the administration of talking with these with these clients. Um, I I'm, have no question that they'll still be able to help the client, but it will not be up. I, should, I shouldn't say not be, but I assume it will lessen the capability of, of someone from a Norwalk or Stanford agency being able to come. So, but but, but the, uh, the effect, what we want, and the outcome, it does not lessen for the person in need. It's not going to, they're not going to be uh, penalized. Um, any, any questions? It's just really, it's the flavor of the community. Uh, and I, what we do at Human Services, um, the social workers, two social workers there is Marcy Rand, who's the adult senior caseworker. She takes any, any adult out of high school and older. And then uh, Jackie DeLouis is the youth family. And she's been there for years and she deals with the families and, and, and children. Uh, she does get grants from the state. She has about, I think, 31,000 this year. And that goes to, she has the discretion. Um, it, it, that goes to groups at school, uh, the, the, their qualification for these grants. It has to be child-based and, 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 and the, with the essence that it's helping them in terms of moving along their, their years. So she has discretion over that. And definitely a lot of the... Uh, the, the groups at school, the clubs at school, they, they utilize that for their groups, meetings, and events. Excellent. Any questions, comments, Any? anything? No? Thank you for all the uh, excellent, very valuable, important yeah. work your department Thank you. does. Thank you. It's it creates critical. a community, and I, I appreciate you and your Essential. interest in it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you for yeah. being so concise in, in the presentation. Oh, was, <laughs> sorry. Was perfect. Yeah. Exactly. I had Thank two you. slides. So, but, you did yeah. a great job. <laughs> you know your budget <laughs> really well. Thank you. OK. Thank you. All right. Good. We'll move it along. Uh, the library is up next. <clears throat> Share my screen. Yes. Bob, she needs to be able to uh, share her Hello. screen. Hi. <clears throat> Could I just interject something? Before? Yeah. We want to get to know you guys very well, but I wanted to acknowledge Mark DeWaley here. You're here because you're on the library board, sort of. It's our fault that we put you there. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And he's not even here to kick around. But Mark is um, a phenomenal dentist. He's been in practice almost 40 years and has announced that he's transitioning into retirement. And uh, <coughs> amazing, amazing dentist, amazing person. M Mark is a former chair of the town council. And uh, he's also former chair of Stanford Hospital, which is a huge... And very successful endeavor. So we're really honored to have you here, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. And we'd love to have Thank you, for that you guys nice here also. <laughs> yeah, you didn't mention that he's a trustee of the library, too. Yeah. To go yes. to the top of the list. Oh, it just came. That was the Steve Carl uh, reference, yeah. Yeah. But you guys are welcome, too, especially. 
Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. So my name is Kim McNally. I am the CEO and president of Cindy Canyon Library. This is my first time meeting you, so it's very nice to meet you. Welcome. Um, thank you. Welcome. I'm here with Rob Lowe, who is one of oh. our trustees. He's our treasurer. And then also Mark DeWhaley, who is also a trustee, and he's our town representative. We have worked on our budget with the help of our advisors from the Board of Finance. Um, so thank you for letting us share this with you tonight. So you likely know that we experienced a flood on February 18th. <laughs> Welcome to I, your new Jeff. I believe yeah. it was front page yeah. news. Uh -huh. And so we were closed for two weeks and we are fully reopened now. Um, almost everything is repaired. We are just waiting for some custom mill work to come in. We are working with all the involved parties, insurance companies, and the cause of the flood is still under investigation. Um, but we are happy that we are open and welcoming patrons back into the building. So the mission of the New Canaan Library, I have to read this because I don't have it memorized yet, <laughs> is to be an essential place for lifelong learning and a vibrant hub for knowledge, culture, and connection for everyone in our community. We have certainly embodied that in the last full year that we, or this past year that we have been open. So in the last year, we have had more than 360,000 visitors to our library. That's the equivalent of about 30,000 visitors a month or 1,350 visitors a day. Um, we have on average 60 meetings per day in our building. We have a collection of 200,000 print books and 60,000 digital items. And our circulation is up 20% from FY21-22. And for our digital items, it is up 6% from FY21-22. And we offer about 100, a little over 100 programs per month. And that I is I hear that important. number again. Daily visits was what? 13, Daily visit, it's 1350. Wow. Yeah. And that percentage it's, it's is amazing. what? 65% up from the year. Amazing. Ago. Talk about utility. Oh, from what? Oh from, from the last normalized, so 2019. Wow. I mean, it's up 100% from 21 or so, but that's uh -huh. not fair. Do we know if they're New Canaan residents by any chance? We don't know. We don't know for sure. Yeah. Anyone can walk through our doors, but mm -hmm. we see a lot of New Canaan residents in yeah. our building. Thank you. I'm there a lot. A lot of locals who come <laughs> to <laughs> programs like story time and things. Yeah. I know my husband never went to the old library, and he's there all the time now. So. Oh, I'm so happy to hear that. <laughs> the tax preparation through, I took my mother to the tax preparation. Oh, yeah, to the Vita? Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, what? To the Vita tax prep? Yes, and it was mm -hmm. packed. It was like around the corner. So that was a great yeah, resource. Yeah, that is wonderful. It's a great resource for sure. So we offer, as I mentioned, um, over 100 programs a month. 40 to 50 of those are for adults. And there are things like author talks, film, music, um, culinary programs, Maker Lab. Um, we do Red Cross blood drives. We do a number of things. And we are working hard to meet the demands and the expectations of our community. Um, notable people that we've hosted in the last year include Misty Copeland and also Carl Bernstein. And most recently, we hosted David Gran. And I want to take a moment to talk about that because it happened when uh, we had just undergone the flood and we had to move all of our programming. And we have some wonderful partners in the community that we work with. And the, the New Canaan Country School came to our aid and offered their space right away. The YMCA, so did the Carriage Barn. And we are just incredibly fortunate to have such great partners that we work with. And when we work with our partners, it's not just an exchange of money. It is, or not a exchange of money, an exchange of money. It is really an exchange of resources and space and time and really <clears throat> helping to build each other up, for sure. So David Grant came. We had 350 people who came to the event at the New Canaan Country School, so it was fantastic. Our meeting spaces are in constant use. In January, we had our seven study rooms turn over more than a thousand times, which is incredible. Um, in we January. also January, mm -hmm. just the month of January. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. And then the other rooms we have, we have two conference rooms. We have the auditorium and the community room, and they hosted 30 board meetings and committee meetings, which is also amazing. And then we do, oh, excuse me, 70 to 80 children's programs a month. And that includes nine to 10 story times a week, music, dance, after school programs. Um, and we have three full-time librarians and also a tech education librarian. And we 
are barely able to meet the demands that we have from our community, which is fantastic because it really is excellence in library service. Um, but we do we do rely on our volunteers. We have about 15 to 20 volunteer volunteers that work with us in the children's department every every week. Okay, so taking a look at our projected revenue. Um, we are an association library, and there are 41 libraries that operate like this in the state of Connecticut. That means that 75% of our money comes from our town, in this case, the town of New Canaan. And then we raise the additional 25% required to operate our library. So we also re receive funds from the state of Connecticut for loaning items like uh, books and other things to patrons who don't live here in New Canaan, restricted gifts, fines, room rentals, and business center income. So any questions about the projected revenue for the coming year? Um, I have a question about rentals and leases. What, what is rented? Uh, all of our meeting space. So we have the Tate room, we have McLaughlin room, we have four um, conference rooms that are available to rent, our community room and our auditorium. Oh, okay. So when I go on and I want to book a room, I don't have to pay, but there's other groups that come in and there's certain fees. Is that on the website of how much it is to rent yes, those things? Yes, there is a full policy around meeting rooms with a list of the costs as well. Oh, cool. I didn't know that. Thanks. And the, the lease is the farmer's grind, the, the cafe. Right. There's something like an arts organization, like when New Canaan Chamber Music, do they pay any fee to be there or is that a pro like your programming? Because they, it, because they charge tickets. Sure, so it depends. When it's a library program, there is no ticket sales, but if they are renting our space and having a program on their own that we're not co-sponsoring, mm -hmm. then they do sell tickets. Mm -hmm. And so like this yeah. Connecticut stage, there's some, a mm -hmm. theater group, that, that's, yep. that's all the, the, the rental fees. Yes. Okay. So, and you know what? Nonprofits can rent. Um, they get a discount. Local companies, people can rent for meetings for their individual groups that they might have. A variety of people use our meeting spaces. Local churches use them for, for groups. Um, the New Canaanite uses our rooms periodically. Um, all, we, we entertain all, all options when it comes to that. Can um, you rent the kitchen? Not for private events, but we do host events um, in the kitchen. So we're having Lydia Bastianich come next month. You are? Oh my gosh, Amazing. that's so cool. Like school uh, for son. <laughs> yep. Um, we, Penny Young has her uh, hand up. Penny? No, yes, no, yes. She had her hand up. Bob, what's going on over there? She's on mute. No. You're on mute, Penny. Sorry, got it. Um, do the tutors pay for the um, uh, little rooms that they uh, meet with their students? They do not. We have tutors that operate on all parts of our building. They don't necessarily use the rooms. They might use a table. So they do not currently pay. And we do not monitor the tutoring that goes on in our building. Mm. I think I, 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 I'm a little curious as to why not, since it is actually someone's professional employment to which they are charging fees so the you know, with the students they, they meet with, um, but using our space, sure. as a library space. I certainly understand that concern. Um, we are an association library. And so we really can't control whether or not people are actually charging for those tutoring services. When they come to the library and meet, we don't know for sure if money is exchanging hands. Can well, I also, also yeah. offer, because my, my son is a, my son gets tutored and he normally gets tutored at home and every now and then if we're not around, he goes to the library. Sure. Um, no, we, we would have to pay anything, you know, extra for that, which I, I guess we could. I just feel like it's, I don't know. I don't know that that's well, there's also spaces think, where yeah. they don't have to get a room. I was, yeah, yeah. yeah. And you don't have to have a room. Yeah, I that's think right. that would be the rooms are in high demand, I would assume. Yeah. But I've, I mean, my son got tutoring too. And there were some days where we just had to take a table yeah. in that sort of study area. And one thing that's been great about the library, if you've been there, is I mean, you almost can't get a room unless you do it a day in advance to the point right. of just the volume. And so 
pretty strict controls for making sure that people exit upon their allotted times. And so I don't think it's as much an issue. A tutor is just camped out there, yeah. takes a room for eight hours. They may have it for an hour. And to your point, they're usually in the smaller rooms, which we don't intend to ever make money on. The rentals, which is really going to be more of a fiscal 25 plan, is our three biggest rooms, the auditions. It's kind of having bigger items so it'll supplement right. our raising, not trying to Nickel, catch every Nickel single person. Dime. Kind of, we're, we're good with them using it. Yeah, and I think when we had the flood, uh, there was an email that went back and forth, and um, I believe it was from Tucker, and somebody in the community said, oh my goodness, the library is closed. Where can our students study? Mm. And I think that made me realize how much our students really do use our library, whether they're being tutored or they're going there with their friends and sitting in the teen center and studying. Um, it was a real loss for them during those two weeks. And I think that's just an important thing to always keep in mind. Sure. Agree. I've got a, a general question. I'm, yeah. I'm new to a lot of this stuff, and it's nice Me to meet too. you. <laughs> um, <laughs> so about 75% of your revenue is directly from the town. Mm -hmm. Is that is sort of a two-part question? Is that historically how it has been? I know we've got a new library compared to five or 10 years ago. Um, is that historically been the case? And how does that compare to towns around us? Sure. So I believe that, yes, that has historically been the case. Rob, do you know for you mean, sure? It, oh, it definitely, it's been at least 10 years. And I, I think just the association, I don't know if it's 75, 25, but that general rule has been held. And I can get you almost an exact number for the towns, because when we were the Board of Finance, that was a slide we, show, we presented. I can say that one of the points we were making to them and we'll make to you, our town, we raise as a percentage more than any of our competitors. And so if we're 75, 25, they're probably closer to 80, 20. And the blurring, just to put it out there, they have often a f um, larger endowments. And so that's almost a third bucket that we just don't have, and that's in our future plan. But I would say Darian is probably 80, 20. Ridge, just all of them, when you look at that pie chart, our 25% is the highest. You're welcome. Okay, so we will move on to expenses. So 90% of the increases in this year's budget come in five categories. So salaries, programs, facilities and grounds, development, and collections. So when it comes to salaries, our staff is our greatest asset. We have 23 full-time employees and nine full-time equivalent. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we put on a fantastic array of programs, and we are able to do 1,500 a year because of the staff that we have. Um, so I will say I've worked in libraries on both coasts. I've worked in multiple libraries in Connecticut, and I am so impressed with the staff that we have here. It's the level of programming that they're able to execute, but also who they are as people. And I feel like I've had a really good opportunity to get to know them. That's my silver lining of the flood, right? When you have a crisis, you get to know people in a way that maybe you wouldn't otherwise get to know them. And on the day of the flood, um, we probably had 18 staff members there. Some of them had driven all the way from places like Seymour because they heard there was a flood and they wanted to do something to help. And that says a lot about who we have in this community who are serving us. And we are incredibly lucky to have them. Um, Maria Naughton has her hand up. Yeah. Go ahead, Maria. Okay. I Just to go back to the revenue. Yep. There are so many classes I see, so many programs. There's a six-week writing course. Um, a yoga course. Do you charge for any of those? No, we do not charge for our library programming. So part of the importance of our fundraising is that it covers a lot of the programs that we offer. Um, and so we are constantly asked, being asked for more and more programs because people want to come to our programs. They're free of charge. They're fantastic. Um, so yes, they are all they are all free to the public. If it's a fundraising event, there will be a ticket fee, but we pretty much you know determined who is that person, is the ticket fee worth it, um, and that's how we decide what to make at a library program and what to make a, a fundraising event. 
Um, Cause I, I mean, I love the library, but I would be worried like our town of New Canaan grant will just keep going up. It, it seems to me people would be okay paying some kind of, you know, supplemental costs to offset these programs. So I just something, you know, I'm, I'm guessing it's not part of the mission to make money, but at least if there was a, a small fee that would help subsidize, I feel like that might be something to consider. It also might put a damper on fundraising though. I mean, I think one of the positives about having all of these incredible, amazing programs, and it is kind of weirdly ticketed because like for Misty Copeland, I went with my daughter and there was, I think, 350 people there and a 500 person waiting list. So you had yeah. to have a ticket yeah. to get in. It wasn't yeah. a charge. But I do think that there is an aspect of all of this great programming. I mean, just incredible programming, free to the community, if you can get it into mm -hmm. some of the more highly subscribed ones. Um, and I do think that that drives a lot of the, the generosity of those who contribute to your annual appeal and you know, to the building of the library. I think that was sort of a promise to the community that there would be these free and open things. Because once you start charging it, it, even if you think it's a minor charge to a family or to a child, it could it could actually be a lot. And I think we sometimes forget that on an individual basis. And a library is supposed to be like I think, yes. the last free bastion of like intellectual <laughs> yeah. exchange of ideas, right? So fundamentally, we don't want to have to charge for our programs, right? Um, and it is a slippery slope once you start talking about mm -hmm. doing that. So I think the important thing is that we're good stewards of our programming money um, and we make best use of that based on who we can get and how many programs we can put on to avoid having to charge for our programs. Your programs are far less or a small per percentage of what you're fundraising, right? Like I saw, I think I saw your projected programs were 150. Uh, projected programs are 132,000. Right, and you're raising though annually almost. We are. I think I heard 900. I think I heard it um, very eloquently stated at one of the Board of Finance um, questioning was that um, b based on your attendance of these programs, that clearly it's meeting a need in the community. That the fact that so many people are coming to them, it, it, there's a, you know, you're addressing and meeting a need. So that's a great positive. Yes, we absolutely are. And we have really big waiting lists for programs. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when you mentioned the Misty Copeland, that's just one example, yeah. but almost every program we put on has a waiting list. So that um, we have to manage that, right? And so part of the increase in, in programs is, do we offer additional programs? Do we offer more of the same programs to allow people in? So having additional program money allows us to make those choices and continue to offer our excellent programming that we do. Do you, do you are the programs available are, are the programs available to out of town residents as well? Yes, right now programs are available to everyone. That was also my question because I've registered, but I don't remember if I had to put my library card in or not. So I didn't know, like with the Misty Copeland thing, did, it's for, open to whomever wants to come. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so just talking about um, programs very quickly. So I mentioned that there's always a wait list and our community is asking for more and more. So this additional money that we would like to spend this year on programs um, will help us get more people to programs and offer more of what they're looking for. Um, facilities and grounds is another place that we're increasing. And the majority of that is because we require additional cleaning services for our building. Um, we are now at uh, 42,000 square feet and the level of use that we get in our building requires that we have daily cleaning. We also are aware of our electricity costs and we are watching it. We've not yet had a full year to really look at how our building management system is working, um, but we are heating and cooling our building as needed, and we have ongoing commissioning to help us manage that. Um, so it might be a little bit longer, probably a few more months before we know that we've been successful in that area. Let me, uh, let me just stop. Penny, do you have a question? Yeah, I do. I'm gonna circle back to um, charging or, or not charging for your programs. Um, now, granted, Lapham Community Center is a official recreation program and totally supported by tax dollars. 
you know, and, and some uh, program uh, fees. But um, non-Nucanian residents are not permitted to um, participate in the program zero. And with the library being 75% funded by the tax dollar, I'm questioning whether or not out-of-towners should, um, maybe there should be a sign-up of residents and then a separate list for non-residents. So in case, you know, a very popular program wouldn't be able to fill all, you know, fill it with uh, residents that, that would be, you know, kind of a, uh, a priority listing of sorts. Sure. I think so, my concern is the taxpayer, taxpayer's dollar paying for non-taxpayers participation. Sure. So that is not something that we have made a decision on, um, but we are opening to open to exploring options of what that could look like. Fundamentally, it's our preference to offer free programming and for our library to be open to everyone. Um, but if it comes to a situation where we have to explore that, then we will look into that. But it's not our preference. What percentage of your programs are fully booked? I mean, if if we're allowing people, non nucanian people to come in for a program that's not fully booked, then it doesn't really hurt us at all, right? right. Mm -hmm. Correct. So what percentage? You know, it's, it is hard to say. Um, I think a lot of our, our story times are fully booked um, and a lot of our big name speakers are fully booked. Those are the most popular things that people come to. Um, you know, a, a writing workshop, maybe not as much, but those are also pretty popular. It's so hard to say. People love us. I don't know what to tell you. What about <laughs> other communities? Is it common to have them limited, the no. programs limited no. to residents? No. No. Consistent. Uh, yeah. Christina, uh, there's a question. Uh, also, everyone, just to keep moving on with the time, I get this issue of you know whether they should be charging or not. Happy to continue that discussion moving forward, but let, let's move on to a, another area here because we're, we're over our 20 minute a lot of time. Christina, please go. I just, um, I'll be short. I just know that for every program that an individual wants to attend, there's a registration. So there's no reason for the library not to know if they're other towners or if they are locals. Uh, other libraries around the Fairfield area do charge for certain level of programming. So if the library chooses not to charge for programming and allow out of towners in as a the same as a regular resident, then are the programs that you are providing available on demand or on your website or on YouTube? How do you satisfy the rest of the community that wanted to see a program that were locked out? Sure. So we are open to recording yeah. programs if the presenter is uh, amicable to that. Um, but it's not something that we do on a regular basis where we have an in-person program and then we also um, make a recording available of it. Like, for example, the David Graham program was not recorded that we did last week. Sometimes then I would, request, I would request that the library provide the information as to how many out-of-towners are coming in to see our programs free of charge. Thank you. Guys, let me let me let me interject. We can have this discussion in a, through a committee meeting. We have a, 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 a representative. I'm happy to have that discussion. Um, I, I could tell it, it. There's various opinions on this particular issue, but we got to move this discussion along. So uh, can we let, let's move on to the next because I, we really need to get to the end of this presentation. Yeah, I, I do just want to say that we have to be careful not to violate patrons' privacy. So their use of the library is not something that we can make publicly available. Okay, so moving on, um, let's see, uh, collections. So um, obviously we are adding to our collection budget in the coming year. Um, that is for print and digital. Um, and then the other, um, the other increases for the year for a total of $3,850,870 for fiscal year 25. Sorry, what are the other expenses? Just curious. They are um, like IT administration, um, 
what else is listed there. So if you go through just the budget, there's oh, probably there? yeah, 70 okay, yeah, line items. Yeah, yeah, we yeah, cherry pick the here. five that were 90% of it. So and so there's a lot of thing there smaller so ones. I just moved to the line item budget. So you'll see under administration, you know, financial insurance, these are really our costs of doing business. I had a question about buildings and grounds. Just curious. I know there's an uptick in that area. So, like for instance, the cleaning is that an in-house person, or do you contract no, we, out for that? And then out, the, we outsource. And also with the building grounds and maintenance, that's also an outsource. Yes, it is. And we have to find someone who can do both lawn and also care for native plants because um, our green is full of native plants, which is wonderful. Interesting. Looks great. Okay. Thank you. It does look good. Um, one other question. The legacy building is on here. Curious to know what the plan is for that. Sure. So we um, are working on an, an art installation that we are putting up there um, with the Historical Society. Mm -hmm. And That's we are great. hoping to do a theme of change makers in New Canaan. Mm -hmm. And in conjunction with that, um, I've actually recently contacted the architect to provide a the original plans that were put together so that the board and I can have a discussion about how we're going to move forward with that building. So like the cinder blocks and the windows and things like that, the, the is there a fundraising plan in place to figure out how to Not bring yet, the building back? But once we decide what we're going to do with it. I see. So you want to find the use done. first and then yes. you'll come up with the plan of fundraising. Yes. Okay, thank you. The cinder blocks are being addressed immediately though. If With that's a specific point, but right, we need to all agree on what the plan is because that's hopefully going to be part of the jewel of that whole green. Right. And you're going to be part of that conversation. Great. Great. Thank you. So I'm um, just moving on to operations. This is a line by line here. Um, obviously, salary, taxes, 403B match, um, and our collection budget is listed here as well. Any questions about this? You all don't collect late fees anymore, right? For books, or do you? Do. Yeah, I do. I've been you paying do. them. Yeah. Okay. We do. I pay it's pretty small, though. And that would okay. also be <laughs> considered part of our other, that it's late fees is, is included in that. It's revenue generating for us. Okay. We talked about that with the Board of Finance. Sort of funny. If you don't remind people, it jumps way up. And so we've taken the course of reminding people, and then 90% of them come back. Yeah, otherwise, I mean, you have to do something because the people We could trick them, and we could make more money, but. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the reminder is very helpful. Yeah, it is, absolutely. Yeah. No, one, no one has to. <clears throat> and then programs and IT here. Yep. And instruction facilities. And then the cost to put on our fundraising events and do our annual campaign. Okay, any other questions or comments? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Thank, you. thank you. Let's move it along to the Waveney uh, item, agenda item number four, the Waveney Park Conservancy, presentation of activities and projects. <clears throat> to get the share screen set up. To, into Zoom for some reason. And we have them on our our tablets. So all right, here we go. Share screen. Hold on. Now I now I it, it clicked back in. Suzanne, I'm Michelle. Michelle, yeah. um, you're logged in as a co-host, so you should be able to do it. <laughs> 
Is this is share screen? Can you pick it up, Dave? Yep, that yeah. is share screen. Yeah, this is it, right? And you got your file? <laughs> I keep saying No, this isn't. Yeah, no, not that one. Not that one? This, I want to go to this one that's behind here. Yeah. Can I not get to that? Yeah, you're supposed to be in there. So. Oh, you're supposed to get to call your fork. No, sir. There. There it is. Sorry. Okay. Electric chair. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Is just Are they in the early 30s? No, 20. Yeah, right. Like Thank you for your patience. Tigers. Hi, I'm Michelle Crookenden. I'm the executive director of the Waveney Park Conservancy. Um, and mm -hmm. would love to tell you a little bit about what we've been doing lately. Um, okay, good. It's on. It's not Photoshop. My controls aren't working. It's a great photo. We can it, on our tablet. Yeah. Yeah, we, we can see it. I just can't make the screen um, scroll for some reason. No. Oh. Interestingly. Hold on. Can someone help here? Here we go. Uh, maybe it's a connectivity thing. Oh, the rainbow is amazing. Yep. But the, we can look at the rainbow all night, but that's not going to help either of us. But if you can read it, we can follow along. I can't read my um, presentation without seeing it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here, take this. <laughs> oh, this is frustrating. Can someone help her? Just can you give us. My apologies. But you're an Eagle Scout. I, I don't have a printout of the you entire thing. That's what it's on. It's a work. Eagle Scout. You really could use my laptop. This hour, we could use some speed, right? You could use my speed, tablet. Right? Um, oh, hi. Yeah. What See, did you do? Eric, right. an Eagle Scout. You have, you have better it. fingers. <laughs> Eric, you get a raise. I don't know how you get. Uh, I don't know how you go backwards. Let's double his salary. Let's double your salary. Normally, um, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> okay, normally, <laughs> normally it goes up. <laughs> Thank you. you. <laughs> <laughs> We're done. <laughs> All right. Um, great. Thanks, everyone. Um, so I think everyone knows this, but we, um, the Waveney Park Conservancy was founded nine years ago as a partnership with the town. Um, and it was really modeled after the Central Parks Conservancy, which was a huge success in New York City. Um, the vision is to ensure Waveney Park thrives in perpetuity. That's kind of been our tagline for a long time. Um, and we, our, our purview is the 130 acres that are on the south side of the driveway. So mm. not in, obviously not, does not include the house itself, but the grounds around the house and then all the parkland that is open space, meadow, forest, walk, and all the walking trails. Um, the areas that include the playing fields, playgrounds, and all, the, all of those um, sort of more recreational facilities are not under our purview. Um, our, our private, well, I think Yana told me not to call it a public private partnership. Okay, so whatever the new language is, our partnership with the town <laughs> is to advocate for the park, identify capital and maintenance needs within it, and then help and plan and fund and execute those. And we do that with some very substantial donor funds. Um, we have major donors. We have many, many, you know, broad sector of private donors throughout the town. Um, uh, this next point, I think I've covered, but you know, we really believe in this advocacy and that we can make a big difference here and the benefits to the park really serve everyone. Um, we don't have fantastic data on park usage, and that's something I would love to work on in the future, but the, it was a 2020 study which was conducted by Westcog, and that suggested that we have about 5,000 visitors true. weekly. True. What I'd love to have is a little bit more um, granular data on where people come from because we're increasingly believing that maybe a quarter to a half of the visitors may be coming from some of the surrounding towns. Um, in February, when we met with the Board of Finance, we asked that they uh, would reapprove our allocation of 300000 towards capital projects in the park. Um, and our goal and our stated mission is to match every dollar of town funding. So we really provide a lot of leverage to the town. The Conservancy also uses our funds that we raise privately to pay for a lot of the design aspect of projects. Uh, that is not paid for with town dollars. That is wholly financed by the, by the Conservancy. So, for example, the service, prod, the service area, which you've probably seen, um, which used to be kind of just open dumpsters and a bit of an eyesore, um, has been really transformed with plantings, a plaza, 
an ADA accessible entrance and things that really appeal to daily visitors, but also to our brides who come and mm -hmm. you know other people who use the park for events. Um, the, that planning and design work was done wholly by the Conservancy. Um, not the not the actual execution. I think that's just trying to make that distinction, and uh, we really appreciate the council's support. Well, and can I just add that it's an interesting point here? You said um, that you cover the maintenance costs on completed projects. So yes. once a, pr a project is completed, it's um, it's not written in stone. It's something we have decided to do, and I think we've agreed with the town for now that we would do that. It's been growing, you know, as it would every time we complete a project we say okay we'll we'll take care of this that we've added we I think that would be something to discuss in the future as to whether we really want a quarter or a half of our budget eventually to be spent on maintenance or is that money that could be better used differently um, but for now the pond area which was restored the new Jenny and meadow um, which has been beautifully restored the driveway plantings um, the forecourt, these are all things that we are funding the maintenance Maintenance of. for, okay, thanks. Um, advantages of dedicated allocated funding, it gives us, um, you know, obviously it amplifies our investment possibilities. I think what's really important is it gives us some certainty, which we can then go out. And if we're gonna invest $50,000, $100,000 in, in a design, and you really need multiple years of visibility on what your commitment can be on that. So that kind of certainty really allows us to plan these bigger projects. Um, it reduces the approval cycles. The town already has some visibility on what we're gonna be doing and it allows our projects to be launched more effectively. Um, and we believe it demonstrates the town has a commitment to Waveney and our partnership. And I think donors, they really value that. Um, I'm going to skip the language there and just let you look at the pictures. Um, if anybody has questions on any of these, I'll specifically um, just mention them briefly. But we um, we were able to restore in 23 the um, the beautiful Eberly Fountain, and that was, uh, as we understood, um, you know, had just not had the option to be restored for a very very long time, probably ever, <laughs> and. Mm -hmm. uh, it really looks spectacular now. Um, we were able to secure funding for a, two benchmark sculptures. I don't know if you've all seen them. Yes, one one is really visible so right on the they're driveway. Really cool. The other one is kind of hidden up at the top of the Jenny and Meadow. So that one we're working to kind of make sure that people know it's there because it's a stunning lookout up there. Um, and those, those actually took quite a lot of doing to get to secure them and have them not only commissioned and, and, and created, but brought over from Scotland. That the shipping part was the hard part. <laughs> um, and we have two more of those pending. We have one uh, where we have funding secured from a donor who's already stepped up. She saw these, she thought, wow, this is spectacular. I would like to be part of this. Um, and then we're considering what, how we'll fund the fourth. Um, we were also able to redesign the whole service area that we just talked about. And that was a fantastic really great cooperation with the town. Tiger Man picked that up and ran with it and beautifully executed it. Um, we have done the initial survey work to begin a very substantial remediation project on the Merritt Trail. So this is the most southernmost portion of the park trail system, which is really in dire need of some help. Um, I think anybody who uses it to walk or run recognizes you sort of feel like you're about to run onto the merit. Uh, it's certainly very visually unappealing, a lot of noise level. We think we can do a lot to mitigate that. You can't eliminate it, but we can mitigate it and make it a much better visitor experience. Um, so we've done uh, a very extensive tree survey. We've done uh, topographical surveys with RKW, and uh, we are now just about to begin the planning stage of what that landscape redesign could look like. Uh, the Jenny and Meadow is really flourishing, but still has some consistent issues with invasive mugwort, phragmites, some of the other things that plague meadows in, in Connecticut. Um, but we continue to work on that and maintain that. And uh, we, will, we will be doing a little bit of tweaking the meadow. So it, I think it may have just been cut today. It's going to be reseeded, which is not typical of a meadow at three or four years in development, 
But I think the person who's working with us, which is uh, the firm Pennington Gray, uh, felt that he would do that at his cost because he wasn't feeling that there were enough florals in the meadow. And so he wanted to try to enhance that. Okay. So fantastic of him to be that generous. Yeah. Um, the South Avenue entrance was replanted in the fall. The uh, roof of the wall garden was a partnership with the garden club and the town and that um, came out really well. And then finally, again, the maintenance that we continue to provide. Um, some of the things, some of the smaller things, we do sponsor summer concerts. We, we helped with Pops in the Park this last year, which I think was a huge success for those who got to see it. Um, we usually do at least one of the other summer concerts. Um, the planters around the house and the terrace are, are provided by Earth Garden at, uh, it's a combination actually of town and conservancy funds and then we added the dog waste receptacles I think they're helping it's never a problem solved but I think they're helping um, just flipping ahead to uh, this year and next we're on a calendar year you're on a obviously a, a different cycle so I added some sort of 24 25 um, the the sort of marquee project for this year is going to be the merit trail design and Heritage Landscape Firm is who we have decided to partner with. They have offices in Norwalk and in Vermont, and they are nationally renowned, award-winning, really have fantastic experience in large municipal parks. And actually, Olmsted Design Parks specifically is something that they know a lot about. So that, that excited us, and they were also recommended by Jay McBride, who was sort of our initial consultant in this project. So sort of a triple win for our for choosing someone. Um, we are expecting that planning phase will take us through most of the year. So I don't think we'll see anything like shovels in the ground or you know approvals until late this year. Um, the second major project for us is Woodlands Invasive Management. And we're gonna be starting with the perimeter of the Genium Meadow because the Genium Foundation has kindly allocated $100,000 for that work um, and we think it'll make a fantastic pilot as to what we can accomplish with both mechanical removal and uh, some very selected targeted herbicide removal and then a follow up with understory restoration work. So I think that will be a really great thing to be able to do and see what the results look like and see if we can raise additional funds around that idea. No goats? Like um. <laughs> Did you hear that? Yeah. Did she, she asked about the goats. You know, the oh, goats. Yeah. Goats, like, the to... goats that did so much work no, in Irwin. I know. I, I don't know if that's actually something that would be viable. I yeah. can ask John I how. It's hard to know. <laughs> like how you would. Yeah. Yeah. Just a thought. Well, they, the they do a long. good job as long as you keep them there. Yeah, it's that the, when them. you let them go, you know. They attract visitors, visitors, though, for sure. They like, do attract yeah. visitors. Like good, you know, cute little. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's it's working in the in the nature you center right now. They're having no, a no, good kids. project. Kids. Well, I was yeah. talking about coyotes. So. No, I meant kids. Like, <laughs> kids like to go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to say No, that. no worries. Um, the Mine's covered so porch yeah. of the most of the house and the forecourt and around the perimeter of the house has been fairly fairly well landscaped, but the sort of covered porch area to the, I don't know which direction that is, but uh, that that is sort of still in need. So we ha actually have funding allocated that donors have sponsored uh, so we can complete that this year. Um, we, as I said, will have hopefully one at least and maybe two additional benchmarks. Um, and then uh, Keith Simpson has been working with Tiger Man and um, we have helped fund an arbor plan and that will be both removal of some trees that are either inappropriate, dangerous, you know, just aren't making sense for the overall scope of the park and then additions, selected additions of trees. Um, so we'll, we'll know more about that quite soon. Uh, the rock wall work has been ongoing and there's a southwestern corner along Lapham that still needs to be finished and we've agreed to help fund that. Um, the Lapham Room entrance needs a little, a little touch up. I think that's a fairly minor project. And then uh, continuing maintenance, of course. For us, our, our, we have not had a fund, a major sort of in-person fundraising event. We only have done mail appeals for the last quite few years. So 2017 was the last time we had a, a fundraising event. So next year will be our 10th anniversary and we are planning something really terrific for, for next year. Great. Idea. Great. 
Um, just a couple of conclusions, really, just to thank you for all the support in the past. Um, we would love to continue with our shared support, and we hope that we can continue to be a good steward of the funds. We're, we're a lean crew. It's me and, um, and a really terrific hands-on board, but you know, we're, we're lightly staffed, so we really, I think, are very effective use of funds. Um, and you know, I think it's some important to the town. I know you. I know you guys all believe in that. <laughs> Any questions? I have just one um, on the potential projects to absorb talent allocations. You show uh, basically 1.8 up to give or take four and a half million. Looking forward, these are projects. How much of that do you actually have, and how much do you have to raise over what time period? That is um, a five-year uh, right. uh, idea. Um, I think we would, right now, I would say funds on hand are about 500,000, a little over okay. five, 550. Um, if we get going on this Merit Trail project soon, that will, as you can see, absorb yep. quite a bit of it. Um, I think it's, Really, we can adjust our plans to suit the scope of, of a project, right? So Merit Trail is going to be a, a menu of options. Clearly, it can be a vast project, or we can decide to contain it and keep it at a more, much more modest level. I'm not sure I'm answering your question. No, it's just uh, is you obviously must have a plan for fundraising going forward. Oh, yes. If well, we have two annual at, appeals, yeah, and yeah. We, um, we raise about – 100 to 120 of that and uh, on just those two appeals mm -hmm. and then we have um one-on-one -on -one conversations with donors that yep. you know that raise so we, we're typically raising about the match level about 300 yep. but that that amount year. is total not not just or is that just the town oh, sure, that's over allocations. five years yeah that's total. that's those are project total project costs um that that could potentially total absorb project costs. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, a continued allocation i mean i think we're making the case that you know this is an allocation that we really think is going to, to be valued and necessary for for a considerable amount of time I, I think it's great that you're looking forward and thinking about what you might be needing or um as long as it's not you know and i don't think you're doing this but like just coming up with projects to to spend the money it sounds like i know i don't think that's what you're doing is what i'm saying i think it looks like you're trying to plan out what makes sense over the next five years. It's good to have that preview for us to see. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, that, that is exactly the case. And, and I think we've had a, I think we've been fortunate. We have some new energy on the board, but we have some very longstanding members. And we had folks like Chris Shipper who were there since the outset. And he recently rolled off because he's got a bigger role at the Community Foundation. But um, I think people have been able to take a long view because they've, because they've been with it for quite a long time. Great resource in the town. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. Appreciate it. You're welcome. All right, everybody. All good? Do we, do we need, need to make a motion to? Would someone like to make a motion to adjourn? I'll make a motion. She wants to. I'll give it to, I'll give it to adjourn. I'll second it. Motion. Rita will second. Thank you, everybody.